Welcome back or welcome for the very first time to the No Spare Podcast. It's interviews with spearfishing experts, authorities and characters from around the world. Today it's two right here in the country I call home. It's the Australian Spearfishing Champions for 2022. These guys took out the Pairs Comp. It's Bryson Sheehy and Tim McDonald. Today's episode sort of recounts their three days of competition. There's a ton of of actionable information in here to improve your spearfishing. Uh, this is a frothworthy show. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. It's a longer episode, but uh, stay tuned because there's, there's bombs all the way through. So Bryson and Tim uh, were very uh, kind to share their story and journey on the podcast. Had an absolute blast. Just quickly before we get into it, I've got one shout out. It's the Adreno Kingfish Cup um, held down in Sydney. There's an information night on the 3rd of November, which is a Thursday from 5.30. There's a bunch of random door prizes and it'll be an awesome chance to listen to a panel of legends talk about Sydney spearfishing, what's happening in the place, how to get involved in the Kingfish Cup and make the most of it. And you could probably win something. There'll be sausages. There'll be all the normal stuff. Get along. It's the at the Adreno Sydney store on, again, Thursday, the 3rd of November from 5.30. Lock that in your calendars. Jump on Facebook, sign up to the event. But, hey, here we go. Let's not muck around too much. It's the Australian Spearfishing Champions in 2022, Bryson Sheehy and Tim McDonald. Here we go. Adreno.com.au, the home of recipes, blogs, videos, equipment reviews, and an obnoxiously large range of spearfishing equipment for frothers like you. Not only that, but spearfishing trips and courses, courses and trips that I sometimes get to go on. Check them out at adreno.com.au. It's a Spiro's best friend. Check them out, and if you want to buy gear, pump in the code NoobSpiro to save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can use that online, in-store. Use the code NoobSpiro, save some cash, and support the NoobSpiro podcast. Shop with adreno.com.au. Neptonics.com source the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Jerry says, if we sell it, we believe in it, we trust it, and dive it. Neptonics is the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing essentials. Neptonics is solid gear that works, and you'll know it's true when you pull the trigger on a Neptonics mech. On every snap of a Neptonics power band and in every whiz of a Neptonics spear gun reel, singing with the power of another big fish. Buy gear you can depend on at neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. G'day, Noob Spirit community. I'm joined by a couple of legends today. I had their mate last night for a live cooking masterclass at the Adreno Woolengabba store or next door. Um, so I'm joined by Bryson Sheehy, Tim McDonald, uh, the current Australian spearfishing champs and uh, a funny pair of blokes. Uh, it's great to have you both here. Bryson's here for the first time. Tim's been on before for an interview. So welcome back, Tim, and hello, Bryson. G'day. Hey, hey. So um, now that we covered all the all the, your guys' secret spots before we got on uh, on live, fellas, we better get into some <laughs> of the, the meat and potatoes. So w- w- one thing that tri- triggered this interview was um, Tommy Dawes uh, reached out on Instagram and said, I had to get you fellas on to talk about your recent experience in the Australian Nationals. Now, they ran a pairs format, you two dived together, took the comp out. Tell me about the the experience. Um, how much scouting did you guys get in beforehand? The experience? The whole lot. Let's start at the, the whole start. lot. Let's start at the okay. start. When did you guys decide and know that you were going to be able to compete together up there? I think that was a couple of years earlier, bro. Hey, I think um, they talked about doing pairs comp uh, prior to COVID and – and then it got canned because of COVID. Um, is that right, Briar, uh, from memory? Yeah, the Tweed Club was always going to host it, but then I think it ended up being in conjunction with the Sunny Coast Club and obviously 1770 is a suitable location for swim comp diving. And I yeah, pointed out to Tim, I was like, this this whole national title thing's going to pairs now, so we might as well put – what put what we've been doing for the last 10 plus years together and um, give it a good crack. Yeah, nice. From memory, Bri, I was like, hey, let's do this pair thing. I've never been a big fan of diving comps. I've never dove at Aussie titles before. Uh, Bri and I dove together in the Cool World Cup years ago. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, yeah, but that was like a – I was a ring-in because um, Dan or Spanner was – Spanner was supposed to be in, but he got sick and then – like the night before, Bryson's like, "Can you come and dive with me? Because I haven't got a pair." Um, <laughs> so that's that was how we did that. Um, 
Yeah. So when he talked about doing the piercing, I I thought, mate, I, I love diving with Bryson, and you know, the, it suits us perfectly because that's how we dive all the time anyway. Um, like it actually was exactly how we dive. Like you know, you're always looking for the fish on the bottom, and if I can't shoot it, I'm like, right, there's this down there. So the, I thought for me, I'm like, this is actually like going to be perfect for us because it already is exactly what we do. Mm. Some guys like like a lot of old school divers are real got that solo mentality, but I think when you when you're diving doing some deeper stuff too, like being able to tell your mate, oh hey, this is where to go because you've just come from there. You know, like you don't have to stretch out and go for longer dives than you have to. You can, you can not spook the fish and then come back up and tell your mate about it. Is that kind of how one of the benefits you find? Yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah, it's great. It's great working together, obviously. And like there was so, like so many times in this comp, Tim was. I don't know if you're familiar. There's a four meter working line, and the guy on the surface must have that four meter line on him. Yep. To the boat, to the boat float, and then a thirty meter working line, and one up, one down, obviously. So um, there were so many times where I was just plowing just to get somewhere and I just get this massive yank on the rig line. I'm like, oh, yeah, he's seen something. And then I come back, either I pass the 30-meter rig line to him or we switch lines or I dive, depending on how whoever feels best. And, um, yeah, the, the only difference from what we do normally in our free spearing time is we were attached to a four and thirty meter line, and yeah, that's about it. Did it make much of a difference? Because you guys love hunting real guns, don't you? Yeah, we yeah. did, and we and we yeah. still hunted real guns. We just had the ropes attached to us. Yeah, um, we were clipped off to the rope. So, and, and we had the four meter. We had a, a loop to loop around your shoulder. So, you, when you're swimming with a four meter, you you didn't have to hold on with your hands. It was looped to you, oh, yeah. and the other one clipped to you. I, I, like the only probably the only challenge is like going right up and swimming through caves and those sorts of things. Other than that, um, I don't think it really hindered at all. Like it was not something no. you didn't really notice because the other guys yeah. holding the float above you, like they're taking pressure off you. You're not dragging yeah. off the float. Mm. Yeah, it was it was pretty good. It wasn't overly noticeable. Like if you go into a hole, you just got to come back out that same way that you're in. Way, yeah. I, I think um, the the other side, like you said about the hunting deep, even in the shallows, we would do the same. Like yeah. we, we, Bryce and I actually think the same, like hunt the same. You know, we were talking the other day about it. Sometimes you like you jump in the water, and we're like, okay, we're going to go and dive this reef, and and you know, think of diving at home, and you know, you shot a Jew, and and you shot a snapper or something, and. And you just turn around about to dive and, and Bryson's right beside me and I'm right beside him because we're both thinking about the same thing, hunting the same area. Yeah. I, I I think that's just innate in how we sort of hunt the same, very similar. And obviously both got really good fish sense. Both of us um, mate, talk a lot about fish, talk a lot about how to hunt certain fish and that obviously makes us very similar in, in the way that we do all those things. So yes. mate, when it got to the comp, it, it was just it was just – simple and easy and and when it gets to continually diving like that i think neither of us if bryson shot a better fish than me i'd be like that is epic if i saw a really good fish on the bottom i'm like bryson i just saw a really good fish on the bottom and bryson's the same he's not like oh i can't believe you just shot that fish he's just like we just shot that fish because that's how it is when you're diving like that um yeah yeah. even in the comp when it comes to shooting that that big Maori sea perch, like I, I don't shoot that Maori sea perch without Bryson. Like it, it's you know as much as I shot it, I pulled the trigger. We we shot that fish because, um, you know that's that's what that teamwork's all about. How many drops did it take to get the MSP? Uh, was it up, was it caved up in in the comp? Yeah, Mate, we had twenty minutes to go at the end of the comp, so it took one drop, shot it dragged it out with the shot and pulled it to the surface. Like, yeah, and ended fairly deep in that bomby and, yeah, pulled it out and got it up in one dive. And I was looking up as I was heading to the surface and Bryson was free, freestyling, making sure he's right above me and had his knife out already to finish the fish so we could get back in and sign off for the comp. And how far back was the swim? 
from the bombing. No, it wasn't wasn't far from there. Oh yeah, nice. Nice. Yeah. So but oh sorry, go Bryce. So you know you asked before, um, you know, the, I think you hit the feeling or the emotion from comp diving and how we felt. And after Tim shot that fish, yeah. he, he um he goes, Oh, and he's just got this kicking 10 kilo sea perch that's just got a spear through its cheeks. It's just like just warping his body as it belts him. Yeah. And he's like, oh, Brian, I don't care if we win or lose this comp. I've had the best two weeks ever. <laughs> like that. And it was like that was, I guess, that was the epitome of the high Yeah. before we, before we knew. Yeah, it's sick. And then you got the the rewards as well, the good bickies when, once you got back to the uh, the mothership, I guess. Yeah. Did you guys win both days clear, clean and clear? This is it was just... th- three days. Okay. And we won we hundred percent all three days. Oh far out! That's bloody. That's an awesome effort. I'm still tight, but I'm still tight. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 puck the puck goes every day. Um, Ian and Aaron were they were right on our tail every day. Yeah, so there was no letting up. You- nah, there was there was no letting up. And Josh Green, he he dove very well as well, very well. It's a really good field of divers, and not everyone had the success that sometimes you expect up there. Because I know some people regularly dive up there, and they've scouted out pretty good ground, and they they know their spots, um, particularly on those reef systems that you guys dived, and they they didn't do as well as. Um, as you do sometimes just going up there for a weekend away. Hey, I've never actually dove like the bunker group. I, I've i dove bolt for probably three hours once. I I took my son up to Fitzroy for his schoolies with a, with a mate from school and we basically just line fished and, and swam around on the edge of the, the um, lagoon Mm. For a couple of hours, and mate, I haven't dove uh, Lamont. So for me, I, I haven't dove that area at all. It's just not the sort of area that I like to go and dive in. Mm. So yeah, I know other guys have done lots of diving up there, but uh, Bright has only done a little bit as well, I think, from memory. I um, I got a bit more knowledge than Tim about it, but not massively. Like I've done a Fitzroy comp twice, I think. Mm. Um. I've done a Lamont comp once, but in my free spear just around those reefs when we've gone to Agnes or whatever. But I wouldn't say I have exact holes. That's not like not like the knowledge you guys have off around Morton. Yeah. Or, or, totally. or further south. <laughs> uh, I've, I've done Western Australia more than I've done that area. So Yeah, wow. Wow. Yeah. So day one, um, were you Fitzroy day one? Was it? Yeah, it was. That was yeah. that was tough. That was tough. What were the topside conditions like? Uh, it wasn't too bad. It was about probably 15, 18 knots, sort of easterly on the way out. So it was a bit yucky run. Mm. And your starting spot? Were you guys starting on the sheltered side of these reef systems and swimming north or south to get around? Yeah. Out. When, when Brian and I went to scout, we just assumed that every day we'd start in that lee side. Um, obviously, it's the safest. Um, it's the most protected. So we started, we assumed that we'd start in the lagoon at Fitzroy, which we obviously did. And so is the choice to swim straight through the coral and then get out the open side <laughs> or to swim north or south? Are they your three options? Swim west. Or north around the weather face, or south towards the ground, or different ground. Yeah, hey, the issue with Fitzroy is freaking massive. This like it's massive reef. Yeah, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. mate, they shortened the comp to four hours, which is supposed to be six and four's minimum. Uh, which Brian and I weren't happy with because, like, uh, you know, I think what what probably sets us apart is the fact that we usually dive all day. Yeah. Mate, Bry's a phenomenal swimmer and, you know, both of us can swim fairly hard and swim and cover a lot of distance. Uh, so in scouting, our question was how far can we swim? That's always the question. Mm. Um, the, 
the best country at Fitzroy, you could never swim to it in a six-hour comp. And obviously, you're never going to swim there in a four-hour comp. Mm. Um, that That's the problem with Fitzroy. I, we assume Fitzroy was always going to be the hardest day because you can't swim to any good country. You just have to dive where all the boats anchor and all the boats sit to keep out of the weather and obviously flog the living daylights out of every fish that exists there already. Mm. Um, yeah. So that we assumed that Fitzroy was always going to be real tough. We probably didn't think it was going to be as tough as it was, but we assumed it was going to be tough. See, the the thing is with a low-scoring day, Isaac, you probably realise this already, but if you've got a six-fish day and you win it with, well, the majority you get six fish and you win it with seven, it's like a 15% lead yeah, off, yeah. One, off one fish, whereas if you've got a 13-fish day, and there's a, a 11 fish comes in second, It's the percentage is a lot smaller. So you can really do well just, just off one extra fish at Fitzroy. Oh, yeah. So what was your what was your bag? What did you guys manage in four hours? The golden trevally that was sitting there for two weeks weren't there on the day. <laughs> it's, that always happens, doesn't it? Um, and then I spotted – other divers going over the wall and I was like, Tim, we're going to get left behind here. And, um, yeah, then we just made our way around and picked up a peacock, a 3.2 kilo black grass, a, two coros that went like nine something, like they just didn't go. Oh, um, they have to be a kilo minimum. Yeah, kilo minimum. Uh, we would have picked up one. No, we didn't get any parrots at Fitzroy at all. Trevor got a nice steep head because he jumped in our boat because Kieran had engine troubles. They swam a long way, Kieran and Trevor, and they um, didn't get rewarded for what was potentially on, on this spot. Oh, wow. Um, we we looked at that spot as well prior to the comp, except there was going to be quite a lot of current, so we decided to not go that way and get caught out. I seen eight kilo jacks, job fish, mackerel, um, grassies, ten kilo goldens, like a bunch of stuff on this ledge that was if if it was there, yeah, it was a bit it would have been a really good comp for Fitzroy when I think three pairs got six fish for that day. Far oh, yeah. out. And you guys you guys ended up with seven, was that right? Oh, we ended up with six. Um, so the you get 100 points per species, 10 points per kilo. And I we got to a bommie that we did scout, and I seen like 20-plus mangrove jacks on this during scouting, and I think it got shot up leading into the comp because there was two jacks on it, and they were super flighty, like gone type thing in the, in the bommie when they could. And... Um, yeah, I end up shooting two Mary Sea Perch out of that bombing. I knew they were, I knew one was there, but I didn't expect the second in when I when I had a look around the corner that there was another one sitting there and that was a kilo heavier than the the first one I shot. Yeah, righto. Tim's back. <laughs> my phone got too hot. I'm sitting in the sun a little bit. My phone just shut down because it was too hot. Ah, uh, you're right. All good too. Car was getting warm. I did turn on. Um, Bryson was just recounting sort of your guys' six species that he remembers from uh, the day one. That kid's got a memory like a goldfish, so. Yeah, I'm pretty, that's pretty bad. But um, <laughs> what did we, you get we up to, up, right? We picked up a peacock and a black wrasse and a couple of under, like, underweight coros. Um, I, I, shot a, I shot a trout first up too. Um, mm. I remember Spanner telling me, he's like, when you get into a comp, shoot the first fish you see. And uh, I saw a trout that would go, so I shot that straight up. Yeah, you've got to get that out of the way. Yeah. So you don't get too hung up on like, oh, it's not five, five kilo trout, it's only three kilo or something like that? Oh, a Mate, you can't up, can up. So. Yeah, and you're not going to complain about having a one, one of the trout not weigh. I mean, there's always, it's always a good feed. 100%, mm. yeah. Uh, Bryce, so the, that black ras Bryson shot was – Epic hunting. Um, that was that was really good to watch from the surface too because that thing was just cat and mouse, cat and mouse, and he finally spanked it and then just went in and grabbed it. And there was like divers all around us everywhere. That was really mm. cool. Mm. 
And then I shot a trout that would have gone four kilo. And then I said, I'll oh, have a look on the other side of this bomby and there's a big red mouth rock cod sitting there and Tim shanked it. I, 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 was, it, spew, yeah. I was spewing about that because, like I said, yeah. that one species is a massive difference. Mm. And they're so hard to shoot those things. They just disappear in the black and they, they just they are so hard to see in the dark, those things. And you get, mm. what, did you have the, the micro bait that's sitting all up in the front of that cave and it was in behind it? Uh, I, no, oh. it, it wasn't deep in the cave. He just disappeared and I hit him high and my spear got stuck in the cave and before I could pull him out, he tore himself off. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those caves up there, I find them really hard to look at because, you, you know, all the good stuff's often in behind the bait and it's just so hard to yep. make out what, what you're actually looking at. Have you guys got any tricks for that? Uh, my best trick, just have enough time to let your eyes adjust. So laying in there. Oh. Bry- Bryson is really good at hunting in caves. That is something that Bryson is phenomenal at. I was told a trick once, but I've never done it. Like eye adjusting close one eye or cover one eye mm-hmm. and then when you go in remove your patch or whatever yeah and um you'll be adjusted <laughs> like a but, pirate yeah i don't know look sideways look down the line oh yeah and and hunt shadows because you know you might have your um encrusting coral that overhangs say 45 degrees or something like that and you'll get you know a moses or something will come out but meters away down the line but you're still within range to shoot it oh okay so you're looking down the face not necessarily into the back of the cave sometimes mm. yeah right okay cool yeah i don't know that's that's probably the, the only way i could really describe because i'm not sure what i actually do yeah um, yeah get in there but um and he and he gets right in there yeah like right in so you're deep like i saw bryson disappear so many times, like even with that rig line, the only thing you've seen is the rig line sticking out of there. So, do you guys find caves are some of the most productive ground in general? Uh, depends on fish you're hunting, as always. <laughs> you're both shaking your heads like, Oh, that was a terrible hey, cavey areas. <laughs> Obviously, the fish have got to hole up somewhere, they've got to sleep somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not, yeah, you're not going to find a jobby in a mm. cave or, or a Spanish, um, but. The right species, I guess. So planning, like it sounds like you guys had quite a few conversations leading up to the comp and then talking strategy. Was that right? So many. Yeah. Mate, <laughs> we, ridiculous. we planned and planned and planned. Listen, when Bryson talked to me about it originally, I was I was a bit dubious. When he when when it got canned and then it come back two years later, Bryson's like, Hey, let's do this thing. Um the seventy seventy. These are my words. I'm like, Bryson, I'm not going to do it unless we do this well. I don't want to just go up there and, mate, I've never dove those areas. Let's let's get a really good plan. And we we both, we talked a lot on the phone before we ever went up and did anything. We, we you know, like thought about what we really want to do and what we want to target. Then we went and we obviously had a look beforehand to scout and uh, – you know, when we when we did that, we we realised, hey, this is not going to be easy in these areas, mate. Then we like, okay, what do we want to target, mate? We looked at all the fish that are on the score sheet because that's a big deal. Like a lot of fish that you'd normally be able to target aren't even on score score sheet. So, man, we talked so much, and Bryson Bryson has obviously done titles before and and has got a really good head for it too. Yeah. I- I learned a lot at the only worlds I've ever done um, in Peru and just watching like the Spanish and the Italians, it's just incredible. And it's just, you can't even, you could talk for hours about what they do Mm. and um, just trying to use that at a basic level in a national titles to, yeah, to give you an advantage, I guess. Mm. Like thinking about, I mean, when when do you guys start hunting when you got a four hour window? Uh, how, do, are you swimming like are you just sort of hunting as you're swimming, and then but you're really on a mission to get to a point before you start working your way back? Or is Mate, it- the first the first kilometer, first no first seven hundred meters, I swam freestyle, chasing Bryson and the float. 
like there was no hunting that first bit. We just wanted to get ahead. Yeah. And Bryson swam so fast that first. Bryson said, "You're going to be, you're going to be jiggered. You're, you're going to be so tired. We're going to swim so hard." I didn't get that until we'd swum the first seven hundred meters, and I'm like, "Yep, <laughs> this, this is hectic." We, we swam like there's no hunting there. That was just pure swimming, mm. and the ground was crap. So that's why it was pure swimming. So, so. Is it, is it, is it, do you guys like like preparing physically? Like, do you do a bit of fitness stuff, like fin swimming in a pool or anything like that to try and get your um, swimming long distances? I mean, you can go spearing all the time, but most of us struggle to find time to get out. Probably the amount of time you need in order to prepare yourself adequately for a comp. Um, well, for me personally, I've um, been in a lovely little town called Port Headland for the last four years. Mm. And the diving out here is the worst diving I've ever done in the world. <laughs> um, I've dived places where they still dynamite and there's better fish there than here. And the, the bottom here drops about a metre a mile. So, and there's no cave systems. It's just flat, seven metre tides. They get big mackerel. Like you get, like WA gets some massive mackerel. Yeah. But um, it's just not even worth going out. It's just, you might pick up a four kilo red is like a really good fish off here mm. and it just breaks you. But then to do a trip is four to eight hours tow and then 50, 60 miles in a boat and getting a crew together is so hard. Mm. No one really wants to go that hard like what Tim and I do. I, I don't really swim in the pool. I take a, a mental approach to my diving. And it actually pisses Nikki off a little bit <laughs> because I keep telling her it's it's mental, it's in your head, and she's more of the fitness side of things. Wow! So, well, walk me through this idea. So, what what do you mean by you take more of a mental approach? So, you think your way through what you're doing, you just guts it out, like. Well, it just when I dive normally, you get in, start a drift if you're drifting, or you anchor the boat, and. You see if you can see the bottom. I think that's a, a pretty common thing for all divers. So many times I've jumped in with divers. I'm like, oh, can you see that ledge running like that? And they're like, nah. And I'm like, yeah, it's right there. And then already I mentally know that I can see that ledge and I can start working it. And I did a lot of competitive swimming. I wasn't that good, but I did a lot of competitive swimming when I was younger. So I learned a lot about kicking with flippers on not they weren't the the 900 long flippers but just your normal pool race fins Mm. and body position and stuff like that and it's something that i employ on every dive especially in strong current you can actually you can dive a two knot current and get back to the surface further up current than when you left Mm. if you if you position your body right and yeah, pay attention to the wind direction and, and current direction and stuff like that and little back eddies from razors and reefs and things like that. Um, mentally, what else? Oh, leading, well, a while back I had a friend tell me I was too old to win a national and I'm past my use by date now that I'm a family man and he wasn't, wasn't joking. And that just pissed me off. <laughs> As it would. And that put fire in my belly and I was furious. <laughs> How old are you, Bryce? And, uh, 35. Yeah. But you look at the you look at the history of the the names that have won on that trophy. I think 1953 it started with Ben Crop. Um, the guys that have won it multiple times. They didn't start winning until 30s. Mm. And I've dived with guys like Gunther Fringel, I think you interviewed um, recently. Mm. That, guy's a, that guy's charging. Mm. Like Rob Torelli still wins the Nationals in Victoria. He's he's getting up there. Paco, 55, killing it. Yeah. Like it, he's swimming circles around guys half his age. Mm. Yeah. The sport has longevity if you don't get bent or die. So, yes, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a massive mental thing. Mm. 
And a lot of the stuff we dive, like I, I'm scared of diving coughs personally because it's almost bottomless when you're drifting. Like, yeah, I think the floor there at Big Island's what, 50 metres, Tim, 55 metres? Yeah, something like that. You dive Morton, and even if you miss the front edge, what's Steve's going to dive 40? Uh, yeah, pretty much. There's, a, there's, there's like a, there's a floor. So mentally I know because I don't dive with a dive watch I re- very rarely. The only time I put a dive watch on is where there is no floor, where you can go too deep. Mm. And, um, yeah, so the places we dive have a floor. You can't swim through the bottom. So just dive down, check it out. Yeah, right. I, I think what like Bryce is trying to say there with the mental side of it mm. is – is the ability just to go, I can do this. I know how good a diver I am. I know I've dove this many times. I've focused on that. And, you know, we did have, we had a couple of weeks of scouting and we swam. So we swam a long way in scouting um, because we needed to know what we're looking at. And so uh, Bryson had that side of it, but he always can just click that, that head back in. I know what I can do. I know how deep I can dive. I know how good I am. I think that's probably what Bryce is trying to say. Mm-hmm. Where I got to do, I got to do. He's like, no, I can do. I know what I can do. Mm-hmm. And the only thing is like coughs, crap. I know what I can do, but I also know I can swim to the bottom in fifty, and I shouldn't. You know, that's that's probably what Bryce is trying to say. That he has that ability just to click his head into there. And I think great divers do, knowing their limits, knowing what the limit is. And knowing when they can push their limits. Bryson does that well. It's something that I, I know when I'm diving places that I've dove a million times, I feel so comfortable in the water and it's never an issue. So, yeah. And I guess it's, it's a, you guys have spent a lot, a lot of time in the water as well and consciously sort of thinking about it. Do you, I don't know if I've ever talked with you guys about the competence wheel and you, maybe you're familiar with it, but... Part of the problem with some sparrows like you guys is you get to a point where you're unconsciously competent. You 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 no longer even recognise all of the things that you've learned to 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 get you where you are now, because some of the building blocks and the scaffolding that's got you to where you are, it's like too far in the past. Um, it's it sounds like there's a little bit of that. It's like you, some of the it's hard to connect the dots for like so for a diver like me to go, okay, that's how they got there. It's hard to see sort of where that, that tangent and I was, I guess part of it comes down to genetics. Part of it comes down to desire. A lot of it comes down to focus and then time in the water as well. Is that kind of what, what would you add to that Bryson? So like a person like that has never been spearing and doesn't, has, doesn't know anything about spearing. They would be unconsciously incompetent. They don't even know what they don't know. Then you then you've got someone that um, starts spearfishing, and then they realise like, oh wow, that's that's what I, what I've got to learn to be able to do this. That then they become consciously incompetent, and then the next sort of step is where you've just learned you've learned a bit, and you're starting to get good and starting to shoot fish. You become uh, consciously competent because you, you you're very aware of what it's taking you to get where you are and do what you're doing. But then if you keep going into mastery and you and you keep getting better and better and better, you sort of forget all of that stuff. It just becomes part of the distant past and that's when you become unconsciously competent. So there, there's these four sort of stages. And sometimes when I talk to guys like you and Tim, I have the sense that, like for me, I, I real, realise how much better at divers than me you are, but I can't sort of connect the dots other than, you know, the same old cliches like, oh, you got to spend more time in the water and you got to, you know, put more effort and time into it, basically. I want to add an extra one is you can be consciously competent, but consciously keep that to yourself a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, something, this- something, some things you don't want to share. Like some things, um, mm. some things, if you share them, then. It, it makes it harder for you. Like that's that's a thing um, yeah. that you become conscious about. And and not many people are honest about that. Most people are like, no, no, no. But, you know, there's some things that you, if you don't spend enough time thinking about it, you will always be unconsciously, incom- uh, unconsciously competent. Mm. But 
I think Bryson and I spend enough time talking and and having conversations. What is it that made that work? Like I learned on that on that Australian titles how to hunt like Bryson hunts in a way that we've never hunted before. In the Australian titles, we swam in areas that together we've never swum, hunted fish we've never hunted, in styles we've never hunted together ever. But that first day I watched Bryson and I adjusted my diving to suit what he had been doing mm. uh, because it was working for us that first day. Uh, right so I was consciously understanding I was incompetent and then I become consciously competent. I watched what he did. I yeah. copied it and, and it worked for me and I shot fish copying some of the things and he did the same. I watched him on the last day of the comp shooting fish the same way that I'd been shooting fish the first two days and it, and it made us a better team. And I, that was a very conscious thing to me. I'm not sure if it was for Bryson, but I spent a lot of time thinking through, and I think we've talked about this in the last one, every little thing that I do, I think about it. Mm. Uh, are you talk, are you talking like the shallow hunting, Tim? Yeah, just even the way you hunted mm. in the shallows. You you adjusted and shifted and you yeah, shot. I've, set. I've never done that because A, I'm a shit shot, and B, I've never hunted the shallows like that. I might usually hunt the shallows a little bit differently because it's mainly wash when I dive the shallows. But but obviously the backside of these reefs are quite protected. So So yeah. we're like yeah, hunting fish like our parrots. Like they're not off in the deep water. They're up in the shallows. And you're not trying to lay on the bottom for a hundred years. Like some of those parrots you're shooting with 10 second dives. Um and you're, you know, trying to shoot them on the way down and, and you're trying to shoot them while you're on the move because you're trying to keep cover and country. Um, mm. And listen, in in the in the months leading up to it, I was starting to think through. I actually did a trip up and dove Sykes Reef with some friends from UK a couple of months before the titles and, and Tack and Jess. Yeah, I saw and, the video, yeah. Yeah, when I went and did it, I actually did it with a uh, – with a bit of a, okay, what what sort of fish? I'd already looked at score sheets and all that stuff. So I tried to shoot all the fish that I would be shooting in the comp and and as a bit of a, like some of those parrots, I never even bothered hunting parrots like that ever before. Mm. Long-nosed um, parrot, long-nosed parrot. Yeah, like I, I've never even seen a long-nosed parrot. I never even paid attention to what they were mm. um, until, until we got up there and did that, um, you know, the other parrots. So... When I went up and did that, I was already starting to think through and I and I devised when I was there, okay, that's not going to work. Land on the bottom, I ain't going to shoot those parrots. Oh, on the drop, I shot them. That worked. And then I I did that when when Bryson was watching me and he knows that, mate, I can shoot a fish on the way down with a really bad angle, like from above on fish that's taken off and I can hit the fish. Um, and... Yeah, Bryson. I watched Bryson shift and change and do that over the course of the three days of the comp. And in that last day, shot some really good fish and helped us to do that. I shot a big red throat on that second day. That was uh, a good mate, fish. It was, it was like the longest, hardest shot on a 10-second dive. And, you know, without even taking a breath, it was just there. I had to take it in reasonably shallow water, drop form shot it, then I had to chase along the bottom because my spear was nearly pulling out. Those shots are really hard. Mm. And, yeah, I watched Bryson adjust and start to do them on those last couple of days. Mm. Until that I was conscious. Up. I think that's so, a conscious thing. Mm. Mm. The thing is you're always learning. There's so much to learn. Um, yeah. So, so much to learn. And I don't like to think that I forget the basics because – for me, one of the first things I remember learning is identifying fish from silhouettes from the surface. I still do it to this day. Mm. But, yeah. Equalising problems can be something that derail you. Not today, my friend. Go to freedivingfamily.com. Check out the either the Friends or an Advanced Friends or video or the Mouthful and Deep Friends or Equalization course at freedivingfamily.com. You can use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. These courses are put together by Adam Stern and a select team of, of, of legends and to help you overcome different issues and help you perform better. And some of them are extremely relevant for freedive spearing. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. 
Shrek, my dude. You're killing it on the Noob Spiro podcast. Every guest you get on frosts on the spearing life, and the actionable info is off the chain. Over here at Spearing Magazine HQ, it's the same, buddy. So many noobers are submitting their adventures, lessons learned, and pictures here at spearingmagazine.com. Just wanted to say that uh, noobers can get an international subscription here at spearingmagazine.com. They can also check out our In the Face Apparel or getting a subscription to the world's greatest spearing magazine. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. Shrek, thanks. Love what you're doing. Jeremy out. Friends, check out oldbandblue.com.au. It's quality made dive gear right there in the Western Australia by a really cool team. The Old Man Blue team are a very experienced bunch of frothing spiros that live the life and have done so for a number of years. Check it out at oldmanblue.com.au. So a lot of hunting for you guys is like being able to have a sort of an understanding of the the bottom, like what's going on in terms of um, sort of obviously where the current's hitting and then being able to pay attention to the structure and have an idea of what it's going to be like from the surface before you even start your drop. I think it's, I'll go the opposite way, having an understanding of fish and then saying where are we going to find those fish. I think that's what I would have said we did in the Australian titles. Mm. Uh, yeah, we did that for sure. It was like, what fish do we want to get? And then what are the added extras, the bonuses? Like a Maori sea perch. We shot three Maori sea perch in that comp. Obviously, nobody else shot a Maori sea perch other than us. And it was it was like, they're the awesome bonus fish. Um, they weigh so, good. Yeah, they weigh good. So, okay. What are the fish we really want? We want to shoot X, Y, Z. Um, I think we shot 15 or 16 species during the comp. So nine, we, I think it's 19. 19 species. Yeah, 19 yeah. species. So we started going, look, this is the fish we think we can target, these species. All right, let's 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 find country that in swimmable lengths that is going to be where these fish are going to be. So then we have a look at the charts. We then swim over the country. Once we swim over the country, we're like, okay, these fish are going to be here. And obviously if, when, you, when you're scouting, you're seeing those fish there and it reinstills in your head, yeah, that's where those fish are. So when you, when you think about a species, do you think about like some people say like you need to know, to know and understand a species, you need to understand where it likes to shelter and then where it likes to feed. And then the other two primary things you want to know about that fish. Is, is, that, is, it, is it that clear cut? Or is there more to it? I think it's even more clear cut than that because I never thought about where a fish likes to feed and that. I just go, I've seen those species on that ground. Okay. I think I think Enough. where they like to shelter, where they like to feed, a lot of those fish that we were hunting in the Australian titles don't don't go very far. They feed in the same place they shelter. Uh, you probably add to that your spangos, your jobbies, those your sand species that you know they're they're going to be there or they're not going to be there. They're going to be there because they're feeding, mm. or they're living off in the deep water and not coming in at all. Most of the spots we dove, pelagic wise, was too far a swim away from other species that we never bothered actually chasing pelagics. I guess they're either there or they're not sometimes. But if you're not getting your reef species to sort of top up that time. Then maybe yeah. it's it's your time's better off spent elsewhere. So a lot of it's like it's, it's like you're almost using economics decisions, like opportunity costs. You want to be in the in the most target rich environment to give you the greatest 100%. opportunity. Yeah, like that's hundred nice. percent it. Yeah, like people ask you why comp spearing. You know, you're raping the reef, blah blah blah. Typical, all that stuff. Mm. But the allure is putting together the perfect day or heat in a yeah. certain time period. Mm. Like you've got this list, I don't know, there have to be 60 fish on that list. Mm. And you're like, realistically, 15 is a very good day. And it's it's quite a restrictive list considering what is out there. But to do it all and put it together and not miss anything mm. and not have anything go under the kilo weight, I have never done a heat in any of my competitions and gone, I shot everything and I'm happy with everything that I saw, got, and weighed. 
And it's that allure that you can be dropped anywhere in the ocean or on any beach against the best divers in the country and win and out swim and out shoot and bring everything back better than anyone else. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And you guys did it. So, um, I put out a question just to the Noob Spirit community on Facebook. I told them I was interviewing a couple of legends later in the week and they they put together a few questions for me. Do you guys mind if I start hitting you with a few? Yep. So Ben Leeson and Nick Johnson both asked sort of for tips um, on exploring new ground, what to look for, et cetera. I'll leave this up, Tim. Um, If it comes comes to new ground around – um, around the reef like that. It, just say if we're talking about the Capricorn Bunker Group mm. and around Bolt, Lamont, Fitzroy, if you're going to look for new ground, your sounder is a little bit useless because there is so much ground. Mm. Uh, you literally are driving over country continually. And so the sounder is like up and down, up and down, especially around those reefs. You need to put eyes on. Yeah. So even though we drove around and sounded like it's a waste of time because you need to actually look at every single rock. You'd be like in, out, in, out, in, out. Mm. Um, so swimming it, just taking the time to swim it mm. because there's just too much country there. And I think that's probably the issue with some of those areas. There is so much country. You've got to find the best country. Um, so we swam it and dove it. Like that's that's where our scouting went, um, swim, swimming, diving, and then remembering because in the in a comp, no GPS, none, no charts, none of those things. You're just swimming and remembering. So, I think that's one of the things that probably sets us apart as a team. Uh, I've got a really good memory. I got a. Like I could still, I could draw detailed maps of all those comp zones <laughs> on the rocks because I, even now just talking about it, it's like flashing in my head, like just thinking about where i got to swim and what i got to do. So finding new ground at places like that, mate, a sounder is useless and, a, and almost a waste, waste of energy. Charts are useless and waste of energy. You've got to actually be in the water and look. If you find a spot that you think is good, uh, I mean – how much time do you give it before you make the decision to move on? Like uh, how many drops do you take? Um, like sometimes you like, for example, you, you might have an aggregation, like you got, you can see clear like bait down there. It looks like there's two other species hanging around. So you think, Oh yep, that looks like a, a fruitful spot. There's a bit of current hitting there. How many drops do you give it before you're like, ah, oh, no, we're moving on. Like, Just I get- to clarify, are we talking about for comp scouting or are we talking about spear in the comp? In the comp, scouting or free spear? Oh, I've gone back to sort of in the comp. So you've already, let's just say you've already. Depends on the potential of the spot. Yeah. If it's like that MSP vomit um, Fitzroy, that thing was going to take some time. Yeah. And it, and it did. And, yeah, you just got to work it. Like, yeah, just got to yeah. work it hard. Do you ever have um, moments where one of you is like, no, nah, no, nah, we're going to stay here. And then the other one's like, no, nah, no, nah, we're going to keep moving. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It, me and Bryson get on really, really well. Yeah. We very rarely have arguments. Uh, <laughs> when Bryson's tired, he gets a bit grumpy. And, <laughs> and after, after you know, doing all the scouting and the and the huge effort we put into, he's a bit tired and grumpy. Mm. I, I'm usually pretty good at not getting grumpy. But on the first day of the comp, I was yelling at Bryson. We'd measured out to the, you know, to the meter where we're at. I knew where we're at. And I knew we had 1.8 Ks to swim home against the current over the reef, which we wouldn't be able to even swim it after walk at that it, it was getting that strong. And Bryson's like, nah, let's keep swimming. Let's keep swimming. I'm like, Bryson, we made a rule. We're not going to swim past this rock. And you're saying now keep swimming. And mate, we've got an hour to go. Nah, let's keep swimming. I'm like, Bryson, no. So we we messed around for a 15 minutes and did a couple more dives. He's like, we haven't got enough fish. I'm like, Bryson, we've got 45 minutes to swim back home, 1.8 Ks. We are going right now. And he's like, no, 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 let's keep going. He's like, listen, when Bryson dove there in the Queensland titles, he swam and got late because 
that's what happened. This did, obviously did the same thing in the Queensland toss. I just I was I was five k away with an hour and a quarter to go, and I got back fifteen minutes late. Yeah. So I not, I was like, oh Tim, those boats are just there. Let's suit some more fish. I measured it. I knew how far it was. I'm like, nah, Bryson. <laughs> I, I started swimming. I started dragging him, and then he's like. Wow, there's a fish here. I'm like, I don't care. We're, we're going. Mate, it, going over the reef at that stage, the tide was pouring out of the lagoon. So going over the reef, we had to stand up and walk backwards for the first 50 metres because it was like running so hard you couldn't actually swim against it going over the over the shallows to get back into the lagoon. So like the first 50 metres took us like 15 minutes. and And then we had like, a 1.5k or whatever, 1.7k swim, mate, I freestyled the whole way home yelling at him because he kept hunting the whole way behind me. and <laughs> Getting dragged sideways trying to shoot stuff under plate. I'm oh, like, are you trying to get us disqualified? What are you doing, mate? Like, you're a nut. <laughs> and I'm like, I yelled at him, like, swim, Bryson. Mate, I'm freestyling, kicking and freestyling. We got back with three minutes to spare. <laughs> And Bryce is like, look, we still had three minutes. I'm like, you're an idiot. <laughs> that was a closest and then, thing. And then we swam back to our boat and swam over a golden trevally getting cleaned by a cleaner ass just oh. under our own boat. Oh, funny. Yeah. And I was funny. like, there's there's so many points in that thing right there. Uh, mate, I, I literally, like, it, it was just the craziest thing. So we had, we had a fair discussion. At the end, Bryson's like, yeah, you're right. We needed to. Listen, I, I swam as hard as I could and we still only had three minutes to spare. I had nothing left by the time I got back to the sign-off. It was ridiculous. Day, that's, that's day one. Hey, <laughs> how, how important are like having good fins like in those comps? What what what, what fins are you guys running and are they, are, they, are they the best things that you think are on the market for what you guys are doing? Good fins are important not just in comps and everything. Mm. Uh, I, w- B- Bryce and I both use dive R's. Uh, Bryson has some other European stuff as well, but the dive R's are just. Yeah. Mate, I went back. To, I went. I went yeah. back to the dive R's. Just, yeah. yeah. Workhorses. Mate, just I, swimming. I think swimming. Yeah, just swimming. Those the the carbon and agaras, they're just a beautiful fin. Uh, Ray makes a great fin. They're strong. They just, mate. They just. They obviously. The way that they push it through the water is awesome. Yeah, I, I love my fins. Okay, cool. So day two, where was day two? Oh, do you want us to finish answering that question? About oh, 100% the, the, I do, yeah. You asked the question about how long do you hang around in a spot. Yeah. Let, oh, let, yeah. Me, let, me, let me throw some things people need to think about because it's, it's more than just that. Any spot off, off anywhere, not so much. So the bunker group? Remember, the current's got to be running one of two ways. The tide runs in, tide runs out, and it runs opposite directions. Now, there's eddies around islands, eddies around reefs that affect the the direction. So if you're going to go scouting, you're going to dive a spot, you're like, it's going off, and you come back there six hours later and the currents are on the opposite direction, there's no fish. So you've got to think about that. Um, if you're going to If you're going to have a look at a spot, look at it when the tide's running in, when the tide's running out. Uh, if you go on to Morton, the tide, the, the current at Morton runs 360 degrees. Like any day is affected differently. Places like Sunshine Coast uh, is the same. Where you go tweed 300 days a week, the tides, uh, the currents run in one direction. Uh, the best place and, on earth. The best place on earth. Sorry. Yeah. Just thought I'd say that. Yeah. Same, same with Stratty. 300 days a week, a year, it's going to be running one direction. So you've got to be able to think through all of those variables. Some reefs, you know, like you're saying, the upside of a reef is going to be the best place. But some reef, then it's the downside of the reef. There's a bit of a eddy out of the current. And so I, I don't think you can ever go to one place once and go, this is crap. You know, you go to one place once and you're like, okay, I wonder what it's going to do on the opposite tide or wonder what it's going to do when the current's running this direction. So it, more than giving an answer, I'd throw those questions out to people that are, they need to think about that when they're scouting. What's the tide doing now? What's it going to be doing in six hours time? If it's not tidal area, what's the current doing when the wind's blowing this way? What's the current doing when the EAC is doing this? 
they're, they're the things that they want to probably think about when they're scouting an area. So there and you've just doubled your doubled your scouting tied in, tied out. Yeah. It's a silly question. It's how long is a piece of string? How much how much time would you like to scout for a comp like the one you guys just did? What's ideal? Three months? That's what you need for worlds. You're competing against people that are doing that. And are with- you in the toilet, Bryson? Yeah. Oh my gosh. What? Mate, I've seen some dodgy shit on boats with divers involved. Me sitting on the toilet is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's it's good you're sitting anyway, Bryson. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's real good. I'm sitting. <laughs> um, yeah, all good. So, like, I mean, the other thing with scouting is when do you go? Oh, I should. I should, you know, like I want to shoot some fish. Like I'm scouting, but I want to have have a feed of fish tonight, and I want to still have some fun. When what do you shoot? And what do you leave for the comp days? Um, well, we weren't allowed to spear the competition reefs two weeks bef- up to from two weeks before the start of the comp. So those three reefs in the bunker group kind of take up a, a large proportion of the southern area. Mm. So you'd have to duck up to Sykes or, you know, might do the inner outers. But, yeah, so you you just go up there and play a few fish. And, yeah. well, the outbound fish, look, mate, I eat a lot of fish. I don't necessarily need fish. Mm. Um, our, our, our outside of the scout zone, outside of the comp zone spearing was predominantly about, okay, not what fish do we want to eat. It's okay. What are the fish in our in our competition that we need to a probably just practice shooting, and b um, just know what size of fish is the best size of fish. You know, like what's going to be a good weighing size fish. Um, oh yeah. Okay. So, mate, and, and to dial your guns in. I, I I dive every week, but Bryson doesn't. So he just needed to dial his gun in. And shoot fish. So uh, Bryson didn't try and shoot anything spectacular. He just wanted to dial in on a on a couple of dial in his gun. And once he got his gun shooting awesome, it was just about some of these fish that we had never really targeted a lot. How are you going to target this? What are you going to do to shoot them? Mm. And and so it's all around. Not yeah, like eating fish is important. It's awesome, but we eat fish all the time. So now it's all around how we're going to win this competition. That's what we're there for. On the Sign-in day, they actually were talking about doing two comp days and and then you could free spear days. And people were like, yeah, let's do that. And I'm like, Man, we didn't come up here to free spear. We'd come up here to dive a competition. Like, if I wanted to free spear, I'd go and free spear somewhere good, not the Capricorn Bunker Group. Like, we 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 when we were there, we were so focused. Uh, Bryson was probably more than me. When we were up scouting, it was really rough weather and there were some really good waves on some of the reefs. And I wanted to surf. I brought my surfboard out with me. And Bryson's like, nah, you're not allowed to surf. Like, so <laughs> we're focused on looking. And then when we're spearing outside the comp zone, we're focused on just shooting the fish that'll be in the comp. Mm. And then I had to surf in the dark after we couldn't see any more scouting or doing that. So I had to surf when it was almost pitch black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> we're there to win. It was, it was we were pretty focused. Titus Salter asks um, diet and warm up tips for comp days, and I have something related as well. Like cramp, cramp is a bit of an issue for me when I do longer swims. What do you guys do food wise and warm ups for on comp days? Well, this this could be an interesting answer. Do you want to talk, Tim, or do you want me to talk? Uh, you can talk first, and I'll add if you like. Well, 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 for me, on a comp day, big fat cold can of spaghetti straight down the hatch in the morning and then water when we're getting to like just on the way, stop and have a few drinks or whatever. And this is assuming a boat ride, which it was in the, in the nationals and then get there, maybe a couple of sugar lollies or something like that. And then just drink water in the, from the boat float when need be in the comp. That's it. Yeah. Right. Eh? Mate, you asked about about cramp. Mm. I think a lot of cramp comes from you know the fitness levels not being there. Mm. I I dive every week usually. Yeah, and 
I swim a lot, swim hard. I'll swim in the current. I, I, don't, I, I don't mind covering ground. I tried to do a few shore dives in the lead up to that just because I love the, the energy expelled in that. And then in the yeah. scouting, we swum a lot. So we were quite fit by the time it come to the comp. I, I actually uh, have been having like uh, protein shakes from a company named, uh, called Isogenics. Okay. And I've been – so I did that in the morning. Every morning, just had one of those. They really lighten your tummy and they just keep you full and give you energy all day. And then we just had have a normal meal at night. That was all I did. And I only ever drank a little bit of water during the day because I don't like having stuff in my stomach when I'm diving. Mm. So most people would accuse you of being dehydrated then. Um, but it yeah, does, it probably. Does. Yeah, okay. Yeah, probably. You get a – Get a couple of cramps, so you get that that flex feeling you get before they do cramp. Mm. You just stop, just stop and stretch your stretch your leg out a little bit, loosen it up, keep going. Yeah. I know for me personally, if I can't equalize on one dive, that yeah. I'm dehyd I'm dehydrated, and I just have a massive chug of water, and then my ears will start working within seconds. Um, so that for me is like my baseline monitoring hydration in the comp is my ears. And obviously if you get a bit of salt water down your snorkel or whatever, it's a bit rough, you might you might dilute it with some fresh. But, yeah, you just don't have time to drink. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like we didn't dive 99% of that comp. Well, I don't know, Tim might have a different breakdown of it, but we didn't do a lot. Up to 22 metres is probably the most we dove for the vast majority of the comp is 22 yeah. metres. The majority of the comp, 15. Mm. And the like a large majority was 15 metres. There was times when we were in right in the shallows. Same amount of time in the shallows, we're probably in 22 metres of what well, that 20 to 22, 18 to 22 kind of stuff. I think that's why a lot of people like diving those areas too is because it's a com- com- fairly comfortable operating depth and warm clean water for a lot of Spiros, whereas, like, yeah. you come down south, like, where you guys like diving Tweed and, and and Brizzy, like, a lot of it's deeper diving, not as clean water, a little bit colder, a little bit dirtier. That seems to be a pretty good reason why a lot of people are heading north. But I, I think, as Bryson said, that's what makes you have to cover so much ground, which gives you no time to drink. We, we carried water with us, and Bryce, Bryson drank a bit in the comp, just because of his ears to keep his ears equalizing. Mm. But, you know, we, we yeah, end up swimming miles and miles and miles and miles and swimming and swimming and swimming just because in that shallow stuff, everyone else has swum there a lot of times before. So you need to cover a lot of ground. It's effectively a swim comp, really. Yeah. And that got it. Ian Brown, a guy in our club, when I was a, a, a newbie starting out years ago, he said that these comps, the fastest swimmers always win. Yeah, right. And I agree to it to a point, 100%, because if you're behind the Puckos, the Ben and Ryans, you know, Trevor and Kieran, and then us, fish are getting tonged up. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, pick a, different, pick a different line if you must. And that's like what I told you about day one of Fitzroy. I looked up and I seen guys. Cutting, not cutting a corner, but to go directly over the reef in the direction we wanted to swim. I was like, Tim, we got to go. Yeah. We didn't get didn't get our fish that we wanted there. Um, some now, ones, in, in saying that, the first day, every one of the fish we shot, we shot in places where people had already been because they cut across in front of us. Yeah, and and so we we shot our fish when there was already divers beside us. All day there was divers beside us, and they'd yeah, already was. been there ahead of us. Like even even the spot where we shot, Bryson shot two Maori sea perch. I shot a, a, a coral cod. Like while we we're there, ten other pairs swam past us and swam and dove on the same spot. Do you is there much like um, sussing each other's stringer out? I'm assuming you guys are just running a stringer off your float because one of you guys is on a four meter tether line. So you zero have- string up, mate. Shark would eat your fish instantly if they're in the water. So you got float boats. Everyone had boat floats, and and we were like, you, you don't think about anyone else. You think about what are we doing? What's in front of us? How do we get another fish here? Where do we go on to next? What's the next rock? Okay, when do we turn around and go back? Like 
I, I don't – like, they're there. The only reason you even think about people – Bryson talked to a few guys – well, I was just like, nah, let's keep diving, let's keep going. <laughs> um, it was only it was only really the second day because we were working the same bearing. Yeah. Literally yeah. side by side. Yeah. Up, down, up, down, competing for the same fish on the same bombies. And I was just chilling on the surface. I had nothing else to do. Yeah. So I'd sit, sit there and talk while Tim was down. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. I want you in my oh no. I've got, oh no, oops, I meant to be recording adverts for Audible. Today's show sponsors, I can't get over it. You busted me singing my favorite classic song from Finger Boys. Anyway, I've got a bunch of books that I'm listening to on Audible right now, and I reckon you should too. Uh, Breath or Breathe, I'm not sure what it is actually. I think it's Breath, the New Science for a Lost Art by James Nestor. Um, phenomenal information here about breathing. And I think James came about this sort of this idea from his background learning how to free dive. Um, check that out on Audible at noobspiro.com forward slash Audible for free. Noobspiro.com forward slash Audible. Free trial, free book. No brainer. That's noobspiro.com forward slash Audible. Do you like to penetrate? Great news. Penetrator Fins, today's Noob Spiro podcast sponsor, are tough as nails. Robust, dependable performers with beyond industry standard warranty. Communicate direct with Larry and his team 24-7 for all your fin inquiries at penetratorfins.com or at penetratorfins on Instagram. Baby spum finish. These things are smooth as silk. They glide through the water. They give you that awesome balance between power and efficiency. This is Penetrator Fins. Use the code Anubspiro to save $25 on any pair of penetrator fins at penetratorfins.com. That's right, use the code Noobspiro to save $25 on any pair of penetrator fins at penetratorfins.com. Day two was Lamont, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting reef, that one. Yeah, yeah it is. Long, skinny. Mm. Long, skinny. Um, that You know, the, I was talking about the other day. Um, we shot, we obviously we scouted there and we found the best area that we could see in the swimmable area and the boats actually anchored not where we thought they would anchor. And so we had to basically swim an extra kilometer. <laughs> and, Don't you love that? <laughs> yeah. In that extra kilometer, we'd shot eight fish by the time we got to the area we wanted to hunt. Oh, wow. And so mm. the, the, that kilometre was crap country, was useless country. But we still shot fish there. And we shot the fish that we were going to shoot on the good country. So in the end, we bypassed the good country and didn't even go there. Now, because we bypassed, we went to other country and we, we shot another, uh, what do we end up with, 13 species. We shot another five where the other guys stayed in the country that we bypassed. Yeah, right. And when they stayed there, like, that day, we, we like, obviously got 100%. And some of the guys we swam with got, like, 15% and 30%. Um, and they stayed in that country that we are going to dive. So it's interesting. Scouting didn't actually help us a lot on that day. Um, no. It was, oh, yeah, yeah, just diving. So, like, finning, finning pretty hard and, like, heading to a point in the distance, like, you might have swam, say, a K, and then all of a sudden there's a fish that you want to drop on. Um you need a certain level of fitness, particularly if it's beyond, I don't know, whatever you like, let's say it's on the edge of your thing where you're just feeling a bit wrecked and you're starting to get a bit of a lactic buildup and you've still got to dive, punch out a decent dive to shoot a fish. How does, how does that work? What are you, what are your strategies for doing that? My, my strategy, let me speak first. This is my strategy. Hey, Bryson, you're 10 years, 11 years. <laughs> younger. But, but, I'm I'm over, I'm, but I'm over the hill remember <laughs> Listen, Bryson, what Bryson we do a lot of things different like we hunt the same Bryson is phenomenal at being able to just bomb like he does that so well and so like we we were swimming hard and I, I can swim all day I can swim hard continually but I can't swim hard continually and just bomb without even a, a, a minute to stop and get my you know, stop breathing like I'm being run a marathon. Where Bryson just like I'm just like, all right, Bryce, look, there's a tusky, and we're swimming. And I'm just like, Bryce, tusky right there. He didn't see it. I'm like, yeah, dive, dive right on it, 
dove, like we'd been swimming flat out. And I literally pulled the thing and said, dive now, Tusky. He just bombed and hunted, not just shot the Tusky, but hunted the thing on the bottom and end up doing like a two minute dive after <laughs> swimming our butt off. Um, but I can't, I can't just bomb, bomb like that just because I'm telling he didn't even see it. He just bombed and, and then shot it. Um, uh, which was like an awesome pickup for us. Uh, that was a, that was a good pickup. That fish, good bait, yeah. and an an oddball. We call it in the um yeah. in the comp world, an oddball. Yeah. By an oddball, yeah. you mean like it's not planned for? It's it's just no it's planned. Oh, no. It's a it's it's you've got your basics, and then you got your oddballs. And yeah. up on the reef, there's not so much. You, well, your parrots are a basic, even though we yeah. got none on day day one. Trout's a basic, you know. Yeah. But there's not. I was talking to Tim about it. There's not that many basics on the reef because it is so varied. Yeah, yeah. And whereas if you're down off Eden, there's ten basics, and you've got to yeah. get them. And yeah. yeah, so the tusky's a big oddball, especially up on the reef these days. Yeah. So, mate, those sorts of those sorts of things, Bryson can just boom, pull that dive out and bomb. But I can I can do that, but nowhere near as good as he can do that. He does that so well. So I need to stop. Give me, give me thirty seconds. Let me at least stop breathing so hard, so I can at least dive. Mm. Uh, uh, if I'm going to hunt, like it, there, I can, Tim? I can do a bomb and, and shoot a parrot. Yeah. yeah, you lost me. Yeah, yeah oh, your internet yeah. just dropped out for a sec, but we got the gist of it. It was like you were saying, um, you, you know, you might if you're blowing hard from swimming hard, then you're not going to punch out a two minute dive where, you, where a lot of hunting is required. But you're pretty happy to. Bomb dive and shoot a fish as long as it's a, you know, not a lot of hunting involved. I think it was sort of what you were saying. We lost you again. Yeah, yeah, he's probably stuck his phone in the sun again and it's overheated. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I am um, just trying to think about where I learned that technique. Um, I might have just learned from swimming and doing inspection dives to say 10, 12, 15 meters where the visibility opens up and you can actually see where you're hunting. Yeah. So if, you, if you're swimming in dirtier water and a bit of current, you just you're fitting on the surface to hold and you're just doing duck dives to check. Yeah. Um, maybe it's come from that or, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. But I get bored on the surface sometimes too, like really bored. Do you do a lot of those scouting type dives? Uh, if I'm stealth hunting in my free spearing, yeah. I do. If I'm chasing mull away, I'll be very, very quiet and just work work an edge or you can hear bait. Um, you obviously can hear mull away. That has to be some of the best noises in the ocean. And, yeah, you just do inspection dives and then you might see a moving reef down there that's 20, 30 fish in it. When you say be quiet, um there's a bit more to it. Um, Heaps to it. Yeah. Like a lot of us are doing real, like I'm pretty clumsy diver at times, I'll be honest. Um, and noise can give me away, particularly if I have had long dry spells. Um, mm. It is very much like a kind of a, you know, like a practice sort of thing. But what are some of the things you consciously do to you flip your, your flippers? Don't break the surface. Okay. Um, so you're doing a one leg duck dive, that sort type of thing. Yeah, just your normal duck dive. But when you're finning to hold position or finning to move, you you you're putting a an efficient kick into each leg, but not as not as much. You probably might be giving a little bit more downstroke than upstroke, but you're keeping your keeping your fins below the surface. But like any any other foreign noise, like some people use those pigtail swivels on an aluminium gun and they just – and when you're swinging the gun or even the current when you're sitting on the bottom, they'll just make a noise. I've read a little bit or observed a little bit of what they do on the med and guys lubricate their armpits and squeaky parts of their wetsuit. Far out. Yeah, stuff like that. It's pretty, if you, pretty interesting. If you think about the, the shallows, like – you know, Bryce said we're hunted up to 22 metres most of the time. But we spent time in six metres. Like to shoot a, a bunch of those reef fish was in that real shallow stuff. And the dives there have to be silent. Yeah. Like 
if you're hunting parrots in shallow or you're hunting other fish in shallow and you make any noise, they're gone. And so you're trying to be able to get your body under the water without making a single noise and be ready to shoot halfway down and realize you're shooting a moving target. So noise is is just makes it 600 times harder. So you you literally um, – like making sure, as Bryce said, you're, you're getting your body under, your fins under. If you flick the surface, boom, you you mess that up. If you bump your gun, boom, you mess that up. If you if your snorkels bubbled out, boom, you mess oh, that up. Oh, snorkels, yeah, hundred percent. Forgot about them. Yeah. Are you guys fussy with the type of snorkel you buy, or is it more the 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 actions? Because clearing your snorkel, like, do you do that out of water? If you get a if you get a you know, like if the top gets overflowed, like when you're diving in surge and stuff and, you know, quite often you'll get it in the top of your snorkel. How do you guys clear quietly and all that sort of stuff? Yeah. If I'm swimming for like in that comp, we're swimming quiet as we can in those shallows. I'll lift my head out of the water and blow if I've got water in the snorkel. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's about it. Yeah. I, I've got a, like a rice snorkel with the, with the valve on it. I find those, they get less water in over the top. They, you know, you can blow water out easier. Um, Bryson just uses a straight J snorkel, I think, Bry. Yeah, just a rubber thing that I just tuck up under the strap of my mask. Yeah. yeah. And spit it out. I don't even put the thing back in when I reach the surface. Yeah. It's like you take your breath, spit it out, and that's the last you'll see of it for however long yeah. your dive is. Yeah. Mate, I look, I tuck mine into my mask as well. I don't have a side thing. Cause even that, the, the snorkel shaking on the side can make noise. Um, mm. Which in the shallows, spooky fish, so important. Like you try and shoot a red throat in the shallows and make noise, you'll never do it. Just yeah. A lot of guys that are just starting out, like you know, like they, they might not have the free diving ability to get down and start hunting stuff below thirty feet. And sometimes they they're always focused on building a breath hold and trying to go deeper. And like there's so many skills that you learn in shallow hunting though. And like I go out for a shore dive, and if I've been out for a while, I'm relearning everything you know, for the hundredth time. It's so frustrating. There's a lot yeah. to learn just hunting in the shallows. I love shore diving. Can't wait yeah. to shore dive. Um, yeah, well, that's just what I talked about before. I touched on it with fish silhouettes, you know, using the sun. That's a that's a big one. People forget yeah. about that. Slow, slow and steady. Like, yeah, there's so many good fish up in the wash. Yeah. Just got to work, just got to work out why they're there. Most people think that we shoot all of our good fish in deep water, which we do shoot a lot of good fish in deep water, don't get me wrong, but not all good fish we shoot are in deep water. Some of them are in shallow water, and even in that in the comp. If you if you just targeted fish in deep water, you would, we wouldn't have won that comp. Um, we had to look at both aspects of that and make sure we were good at both aspects of that. Even though that in in a free dive and a free social days dive, and we don't necessarily focus on that, we had to turn our focus towards that to become better at doing that as well. So you took out all three days. What was the third? What did the third day look like? We guys, st- when do you start to feel fatigue when you're comp diving? How many um, how many days were you guys starting to feel fatigued by day three because you're so old, both of you? Mm. Uh, I was I was fatigued before we even started. Man. <laughs> <laughs> We, mate, when we scouted, we didn't have anything less than 25 knots scouting. So we we had our butts handed to us in 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 trying to scout. So I, I was already fatigued. Uh, I also drove back and forth from from 1770 to Brisbane twice because I had work that I had to come back to. Um, then then those days of swimming in the first couple of days of comp, no doubt day three was hectic and then it ended up being a four hour comp again which we had planned for six hours and we just swam that I spewed pretty bad <laughs> on just in the effort we we're putting in on on day three All right. both of us were were hammered day three we, we had to we had to leave the best spot out there. Uh, that still had really good fish on it because we're both we're swimming into the current to stay on it, rescuing a fish that was stuck in a hole, and there was still really good fish there. And both of us like, listen, 
it, we just need to keep, we need to push up into the shallows a bit more because this is just hectic hard work. Would you agree with that, bro? Yep. Yeah, I'd say it was inefficient to stay on that bommy anymore. Yeah. Like yeah. we spent 45 minutes trying to get that jack out and I saw, I saw fish that just defies the realm of possibility and still can't believe it. And there's seven kilo reds sitting at the back of the bommy just looking at us being idiots. And it's like, this is inefficient. We've got so much more ground to look at yeah. where the fish are going to be in 18 metres of water. So we left. Yeah, far out. Then you must, it must be a, a fair amount of pressure on you too. I guess if you've spent 45 minutes on one fish in a four hour comp, you guys are both probably starting to grit your teeth and think, we got to move. We got to do something. We got to, we got to keep going here. Listen, th- this is this is the truth. I dove, and there was Bryson dove and said, "There's a there's a big school of jacks in that cave down there." And he also said, "I don't know if he wants to tell the story, but he also said there's like an absolute fish of a lifetime there." Uh, I dove, and there was big jacks. I picked the smallest one. I picked the safe one at the back. And it went into the cave and got stuck. It just just got the wrong angle and it just got stuck. Mate, I hit the surface. I said to Bryce <laughs> straight away, I am so sorry, mate. I'm I it just it it just got stuck under that cave. In my head, I said to myself, I've just lost the Aussie titles. That's actually what I said to myself. I'm just like, oh, you idiot. And then we wasted 45 minutes. Bryce at one stage like, do we just cut this and keep on going and leave it? Uh, I was doing the maths in my head. I'm like, I know that fish has got weight. It's almost two fish. Like if we cut it, we're not just cutting one fish, we're cutting two fish because of weight. Like it's almost the same as shooting a, two coral cods, like a coral cod and a peacock coral cod. Like, you know, let's just try it. That's why we, that's why we dove it out because it was two fish instead of one. Um, what that jack go? Uh, well, not quite two fish. It was 7.8. Yeah. And I love shooting big jacks. And there was bigger ones there, but they were all deep in that cave. And I thought I could get that one out without getting stuck. And uh, in the end, I wish I shot a bigger one. But anyway. What was the better fish behind it? What was the fish of a lifetime, Bryson? Um, dropped down because it was – because, yeah, we just done a bit of a swim. And so as we talked about earlier, it was my turn to dive. And hindsight – I should have breathed up a little bit longer. I dropped down and had a look through the roof of this bommy. And I can see like three mangrove jacks, like the top of the pyramid, mm. schooled up. And it's the greatest fear I've ever had as a comp diver. You dive on a bommy and there's eight fish species on there that you want to, you want <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Do you wish you, you had two wanna, guns? Well, yeah, but it's like, it's, you've got to work out how to pl- how to work it, mm. how to pluck them off without scaring one another. And I was just kind of in awe. And then I looked through this ceiling and it had a big green back. It was about a foot between the, dors- the dorsal and the lateral line. And I was like, oh, that's, that's a Queensland groper. And then a yellow peck fin fla- uh, flashed and it was pointy. It wasn't round. And... I've been fortunate enough to see some big sea perch. Like, how big was that one you blew over here, Tim? 15 plus? Yeah, something like that. I saw that fish and jumped back in the boat and Tim had a go at it. It dwarfed that. It, every part of 20 to 25 kilo fish. Wow. Yeah. And, like, yeah, I'm looking at a photo on the fridge of a 13 kilo fish that I got here and, I can tell you it's about 15, not even 15 centimetres from the dorsal to the lateral line. And this thing was just preposterous and it was a couple of metres away. I could have shot it in the back, but I didn't have a shot into the back of its head. We were diving two knots of current and there was other fish on that bommie that I wanted to shoot. Obviously, that's the best fish on the bommie, but I just didn't. It was almost a sensory overload. I just didn't know what to take Mm. and... I didn't have the shot. If I did shoot it from that 45-degree angle into the back of the head, I would have had to swim through the roof of this bommy and down and follow to get it out, but I'm attached to a rig line. I can't do that. 
So I would have had to pull the fish out the top and it would have been trying to like pull an open flopper through a hole and it just it wouldn't have come out. And I just left it hoping. I said to Tim, I said, dive the bomb you like this. And he was going past 13 kilo jacks and ended up with that eight. And, um, yeah, so fish of a lifetime. But Comp diving. I also knew that we had that that big sea perch scouted um, back towards the boats. Oh, yeah, that bomby was, man, that was fish. Uh, and uh, digging it out, I'm swimming past reds, big trout, swimming massive coral cods. Like, oh, there was so much fish there on that rock. But we also knew there was coral cods further back um, and we'd already shot a trout. So it wasn't as, you know, we, we just kept on going. And we shot five species after that. So that was also really important. So what did you end up with on day three? How many species? Well, end up with we we end up with twelve, and one fish was forty grams under, so we end up weighing eleven species. Spewing forty grams. Oh, that was like that. Dirty. equipment. Like, um, are you guys both still using a rife uh, Euro timber gun, uh, a single wrap, seven mil shafts? What do you? What's your sort of your your go to shooting comp rig? I got Rife 120 Euro with a reel and 7.5 twin 16s. Bryce has got a, a, a Spanner gun, one of Dan's guns. Okay. Yeah, Spanner made a limited edition bunch of carbon carbon guns and it's basically similar to a 120 Euro. I shoot a 7 mil twin 16s, single wrap, and then I had an 80 roller, which Spanner also made that as well. And I've used those guns for years. And Single wrap both here? Yeah. yeah. Especially there. On the reef, you, you can't you yeah. double wrap. You're just spending all day on dig, digging fish out. Yeah. And what did you guys carry? You're not carrying spear guns on the boat flight? Mm. One spear yeah, gun I had between a, you? Or? <laughs> Here's the other argument, Tom. I, I had a one meter. Um, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a one meter rock euro, and Bryson had a, a little roller in case we need to hunt in holes. But I hadn't exactly tuned my flopper well, um, and so mate, shooting that times. jack, shooting that jack, shooting that jack cost us two spears. Um, basically, getting it out. By the time we got it out, it cost us two spears, and we had, we had to go to the one meter, the one meter rock euro. With a bad flopper, and I had yeah, I had a, a Rob Allen spear that just the flopper just would not come good. Bryson had messed around with it the week prior, and it still wasn't good. And so as soon as he pulled it out, he's like, "This flopper's stuffed!" Ah, <laughs> now you and it was obviously we're both exhausted, man. I was spewing, and it, while I'm spewing, he like because we once we got the fish up, I was working so hard holding him in current because the current was pumping where it got stuck. Um, like I spewed and he's yelling at me, you got this piece of crap. And I'm like, Bleh. like, okay. <laughs> he's like, stop spewing, get the gun sorted, get another spear on there now. Because we couldn't lose sight of the, we couldn't lose sight of the bottom. If we lost sight of it, we were gone. We were, yeah, yeah. We were lost. You know, obviously in real deep water, you can only just make out dark and light. Yeah. And so like, I'm trying to put a new spear on my gun uh, he's trying to fix a flopper or trying to keep an eye on the bottom and keep diving and keep shooting fish. So, yeah, and then Bryce just like, we're gonna keep we're gonna keep moving along this ledge. So, yeah, we we kept going. Bryce, Bryce shot a Bryce did a massive dive and shot a really nice spango, which was good weight as well. Uh, and that was a huge dive. I don't even know how long that dive was. That was a massive dive. And uh, then I I shot a uh, I shot a a nice footballer trout, and then I shot a, a nice a coral cod. That was a good fish. Yeah, that was that, that was another great. Footballer. Yeah, that was a good lucky pickup. True on ball, uh, that one. Yeah, and then bro, bro I dove, and I hear dink into a rock. I'm like, oh, he's just missed something, and I'm like, he's not coming up. What's going on here? And then I hear this little dink. I'm like, oh, he just shot a second time, and he comes up with an empty spear, and I'm like. What'd you do? He's like, oh, I missed a red flash rock cod. And then I reloaded and I missed again. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, so he missed the same red flash twice. And and then 
we'd, so we picked up bang, bang, species, species, species on the next couple of bombies. And, and I knew where we were from there. And, and I said, mate, we are about 500 metres from the boat. We got about, and the tide had just started turning, so we have to swim into it. We got about 30 minutes to go. I'm like, I reckon the, that bomb is like just a little bit out of the way, but on the way back in, let's go and have a look for this MSP uh, that we'd scouted a couple of weeks earlier. And um, so we're like, yep, let's do it. And um, I actually just like started freestyle swimming. Like I was just covering ground. I knew, I knew if where I was and I knew how to get there. So I just, and Bryson just followed behind me because he hadn't really scouted exactly that area where I'd scouted it more. So he just followed me. Um, we'd seen that fish in that bombing and then we never went back there. We just left it. And so Bry hadn't even looked at it from the surface. So we just bolted there and swam past a few of the other boys on the way. And I sort of got there and Bry was a bit behind me. And we got there with 20 minutes to go. I said to Bry, what does this thing get stuck? Um, what we do, he's like, don't worry about that, mate. Just go and shoot it and we'll work it out from there. I'm like, okay, cool, cool. Mate, when I when I scouted that rock, it had like 10 big trout on it. When I got there, there was two little fellas. I'm like, eh, this is close to the boats. This has already been flogged. I'm like, what if the fish is gone or someone spooked it? So I knew there was a slight crack in the side and you had to get full body in there. You know, you had to squeeze into the crack. So went down, squeezed in there. And when I scouted it, there was a big Morgan's cod, like 40 kilo Morgan's cod in there as well and full of red bait, like you were saying earlier. So I squeezed into the crack, like red bait, thick as, and I had my thumb on the trigger, ready to shoot, and this Morgan's just like, boom, in front of my face, and I, I nearly thumbed this, like, 40-kilo Morgan's, you know, like, it takes a lot not to shoot it when it comes out of the red bait, and, you, and you're already ready for this MSP, and he just, like, spooked and, like, spooked the red bait back, which that sort of pushed them back and made that MSP come out of the dark right at the back of the cave. And literally, I just had the finger on the trigger, bang, straight through the cheeks in one oh, side, beautiful. out the other. And I just went straight in there. Like, I don't even know if I had my fins still hanging out of the hole. Like, I was that deep in that hole. And I grabbed both sides of the spear. Mate, that thing flogged me. <laughs> like, so good to watch. <laughs> I was just getting completely flogged and ragdolled by, like, 10 and a half kilo MSP with a spear in its cheeks and, I'm trying to back out of the hole and it's headbutting me, kicking me in the face and and I like finally get out of the hole and then like I'm trying to get the service and this thing is just throwing me around like I'm riding a buck and bronco. And yeah, when I got to the surface, like obviously when I first saw that MSP, I like I love shooting big MSP. And when I first saw it, I'm like, oh my gosh, that is an amazing fish. There's no way we we talked about it for weeks. There's no way we're gonna get that in a comp. And then we, then when we did, it was like the culmination of all that hard work. That's when I hit the surface. I was literally, I was nearly crying. Like the emotion of that, like the culmination of all the hard work, the culmination of how hard we dove in that comp. Like we swam our butts off every day. I swam till I could barely get out of the water when we get back in the boat. And then to shoot that fish right at the end. I'm hugging Bryson. I'm like, oh, Bryson, <laughs> like, this is the best ever. This is amazing. Like, this is epic. I don't care if we win now. Who cares? And, like, we got back to the boat and, like, pulling the fish in. Andy Ruddick was there. That guy's a flipping legend of legends. He's just like, oh, awesome fish, boys. Amazing. He was so good. Um, yeah, that was epic. And uh, everyone else drifted back into the boat. And how soon was it till you guys realized you won? I think we, I think when we got to weigh in, yeah, we got to the weigh in. We got there last, um, mate. Most guys just gunned at home, like they just gun it. And Bryson is not the quickest person at doing stuff. Um, it can be, it can be a little slow at just doing stuff and takes time. And so we got in. Most people gunned it in, and there's some boats that just fly. And we just went in. It was a nice afternoon. It was hard. It was the flattest of days that we had. So we just cruised in, put the boat on the trailer, got in there. There was only, I think, us and the and the puckeridges to weigh in by the time we weighed in. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, we left our fish in the esky too, until we sort of got to the weigh in thing, and then um, Ian Ian told me he's like, oh yeah, we got about eight fish. I knew we had 11 and we already were up. So I, I just assumed then that we got it. But we pulled our fish out 
on the on that last day out onto the table to weigh in. Oh, yeah, that was pretty cool. There was so many people around. Everyone gathered. As soon as we pulled that big jack out and and the big MSP, it was just like everyone's going, no way, epic fish. And, yeah, that was that was actually pretty cool. But, mate, at the end, when, they, when we weighed the MSP by itself, like everyone was cheering and then we weighed all our fish and they called out our weight and, and species. Like everyone gave us a big cheer. Uh, at that stage, we're pretty much pretty clear that we'd won it there. Wow. So your first Australian titles, eh, together? You, you know, can I throw a real funny one? Bryson's going to hate this. On the on the first couple of days, I was talking about doing just two-day comp and Bryson obviously wasn't happy and, and and you know, he talked to a bunch of people and they end up making it three days. After the second day we're winning, I said to Bryson, we would have already won if you hadn't said anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, you know, like, to Bryson's credit, he's like, mate, this is a Australian title. I don't want to win it by doing, you know, half of it. I want to do it properly. And I'm like, yeah, mate, that's right. That's awesome. And he's like, it's supposed to be three days. It's the proper thing. And so I'm like, yeah, good. At, at the end there, like once we, once away in, we come out, mate, like Ian Puckridge, he's, he's a tr- true statesman and a champion. Mate, as soon as he walked out of the way and shook my hand, congratulated me. He's like, mate, they're amazing fish. You guys done amazing this this week. Like, absolute statesman. Like, the you know, for somebody like that who has who we all look up to and has done it so many times and done it so well, just to you know encourage us like that. I thought that was that was something special. Yeah. Just to uh, yeah, to just to see like, mate, the guy's a champion. The guy is an has been a champion a million times and yeah just shook our hands and just said well done boys you deserve it you've done amazing but that was that that was pretty cool great news guys adam stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the new spiro community if you get on freedivingfamily.com use the code spiro you'll get 20 percent off any course there's a bunch of sick courses on there there's an equalizing uh stage one there's an equalizing advanced techniques um video there they're two of my absolute favorites if you have any problems with equalizing go to freedivingfamily.com get adam's course and use the code spiro to get 20 percent off any course check it out at freedivingfamily.com today's noob spiro podcast is brought to you by audible get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at noobspiro.com forward slash audible. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone or Android phone. Get amongst it, noobspiro.com forward slash audible. Free trial, free book, no brainer. That's noobspiro.com forward slash audible. In the world of freedive spearfishing, there's no magic breathing technique that's all of a sudden going to get you down and shoot massive fish at depth and holding big bottom times, but there is a way to do it safer and smarter, take down more fuel to maximize the time that you have there. Learn at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted with Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. If you take down more fuel, you can stay for longer. Learning to take a bigger breath is not such a big deal. Ted breaks it down for you with a free online course at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Take down 20 to 30% more air just by learning how to take a full breath. Again, Learn how to do it free at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. So you guys you guys are a big fan of this new comp format by the sounds of it. Uh, uh, of the of the pairs? Yeah, the pairs, the points, the species on offer. Um it, it sounds like you you like it. You like it, but are there some things that could be improved? I man, I wouldn't I don't know if I'd dive in Australian titles if it wasn't a pairs thing. I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I enjoy my diving with Bryson, diving with my mates and doing it together. That, that's the only reason I did it. There's no way I would have done it if it was just diving with myself. I just don't have an interest in that, I don't think. I love that. I think it's amazing. I think it just, it's what makes spearfishing awesome. That's what I really enjoy about it. The point side of it is what makes it challenging. That's a cool thing. Like the fish that weren't on the score sheet, is what makes it even more challenging. I, I don't know, Brian. You might have a different opinion. Oh, the pairs comp is so much fun. Like it's just, it's just the next level on what we normally dive. But I do miss the individual part of the sport because you're doing it all yourself. Like, and I get that 
you got to do it safely and things like that. And it was dwindling in the individual format, the participation numbers or the interest. But it's it's a shame it will probably never come back the individual format. But to to the I guess credit of everyone, no one, not one bit of feedback I've got was like, oh yeah, but it was a pairs, you know, it was a pairs effort. It's not as not as good as an individual. Like New Zealand have been doing pairs for years, and no one discredits the fact you are the Australian champion in a pairs format. And um, that's that's good that it's been you know acknowledged and adopted and taken on board. Yeah, it almost um, it almost heightens the disadvantage though, isn't it? Like you know the puckerage is right. Ian is an absolute weapon in his own right, and then his son Aaron is a, also an absolute weapon in his own right. So not only now are you competing against you know those guys, you're competing against their combined effort. A little yeah. bit like yourselves, you know, like both of you guys are absolute weapons. Then you put that together, um, it, it it makes it the the barrier of competition. It makes the the heights truly like something to aspire to. I think so. Um, yeah, definitely a skewed playing field. I, I I don't imagine many people would um feel super confident looking at a field like what you guys faced. Um, but I mean, that'd be part of the p- appeal too, I guess, like pit- pitting yourself against the best of the best. Yeah. We've only dove two comps together and we won them both. So, and it is unfair because most people dive by themselves. We don't. So we already, we practice in every time we dive together. So I mean, I think it's good for the sport and that's my opinion. It's good to teach people. If, if people can learn to dive together, we will have lots less deaths in the sport. Um, now you can't always be right on top of each other in really strong current in tough conditions that makes it impossible. But the more we teach people to dive together, the safer our sport is. Mm. So that's a, that's a good thing for the sport, I think. For sure. Do you think? Um, do you guys think it's getting safer out there? Do you think? How do you feel about the next generation of divers coming through? Do you feel like they're doing some things better, some things worse? Um, what do you see taking shape? I um. I see them learning off YouTube too much. Yeah. Um, it's a potential problem. Um, yeah. And then there's the issue with sharks that we all know the numbers are just through the absolute roof. Yeah. Um, and then there's more boats out there as well. So like mentioned, we both love our shore diving, but, you know, we will not dive without a big float and even then you still get close calls some guy nearly run over me the other day when i was short diving and i had a massive boat float that i could almost sit in and he <laughs> gave me a gobful i'm like mate he said I was, I was coming over to see what that thing was in the water i nearly run you over i'm like it's a freaking boat float mate uh that's, yeah. the, that's the other issue yeah both boats <laughs> Also, track boats. The AUF had those awesome sort of stickers out. I think maybe USFA had something similar, like where you put them on your car and it's like, you know, float plus flag equals diver below. Um, Because I I think there's so much, so many people in the boating community that don't even know what we are. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it's part of your boat license, it still doesn't mean much. It's just, and I'll be honest, I think that alpha flag, the Blue over white. I, I I don't. I'm not sure that it's a great color scheme. Uh, no, it isn't. You're right. It disappears. Yeah, and the you know the American one. I know we don't like to be American, but at least you you can bloody like it's quite obvious and evident what it is. Yeah. Um, totally. But anyway, we can't change the world in a day, mate. I think the other side of it is like with Bryce is saying with the shark issue. Um, I don't think that's a generational thing. I think that's just what's happening now. Um, that That is going to continue to be a significant challenge in the next 20 years to spear fishermen in Australia if nothing changes. Um, I think probably the only other issue you're going to face is not being able to dive anywhere. I don't know if you've seen the new zoning maps for like the Great Sandy Strait Marine Park, what they're trying to do there. Mate, nearly every every area you can spear fish in the Great Sandy Strait Marine Park will be will be green zone in the next in the next two years if we don't work hard to, to change those things. So so more more of us need to be part of spearfishing clubs because, I mean, they help lobby in our interests. 
Yep, 100%. They, they have a seat at the table in the consultation process. Um, yep. you tweed, you, you, um, you're still a Tweed member, aren't you, Tim? Yep. So Tweed Gold Coast uh, Freedivers, fantastic club, and um, those guys are doing an awesome job. I've, I've Mate, seen. Shout, shout out to Jenny. Yeah. Like, she has done an amazing job at Tweed. Like, she has done an incredible job. And obviously, Luke Randall. Mate, those guys have done an exceptional job with our club and working really hard over a long period of time. Obviously, in the past, Jason Jaffa has done a great job. Um, like, obviously, there's long-term members like Ian Brown and Brownie and those guys. They've, they've been amazing for keeping the club, you know, operating and, and building, you know, a, a great environment around the club. Um, they've, they've been amazing. And, and it's, a, it's an awesome thing. For people that are um – Intimidated by comps, um, do you feel like the social comp sides and in, in the in the clubs are, are are a good way to sort of just test it out, test the waters out, have a crack? Um, in Sydney, that element, I'd love to dive in element, but it's got huge history with the I think it's the four clubs in Sydney. Mm. That was that's a massive feat, I think, to for a tryout for a new person to come into a club. Mm. Um, the Tweed Club does comps when they can, but we're weather. governed a lot by the weather. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's always a, there's always a spot on a boat. Like it's very open door. Fellas, we've had a massive chat. We've been going an hour and forty five. I really enjoyed hearing about your your guys' competition up there. Was there anything else uh, you wanted to discuss or touch on before we head on out? And um, and also, where can people connect with you if they want to? Uh, Tim, you got anything you want to say? Uh <laughs> no, I, I think we've, we've said a lot already. You did. Yeah, that's just the comp. But, yeah, there was a lot in that. A lot in that comp. But they, um, How can they connect? Oh, we're, we're both on social media. Um, I've got my YouTube, which uh, New, New Spiro didn't vote me in the top 20. I was pretty uh, upset. <laughs> pretty, uh, <laughs> got, got, got the big snub. Thanks, mate. Thanks for that. <laughs> It may uh, it may have something to do with I haven't posted a video for two years. But it, it, it might have something to do with the fact that you've got about fifty eight terabytes sitting there at home, but you haven't edited any of it and put it up yeah, for us. That's that's a thing. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a thing. There's some good footage there. I was actually I actually sat down the other day and watched a bunch. There's some good footage there. I need to pull my finger out and do something with it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I put a word out to the New Spirit community a while ago for some uh, young people that maybe wanted to make a bit of extra dough editing other people's footage, because I think like with the uh, the advent now, like Google um, Google Drive and WeTransfer and things like that, you can send large files fairly easily. Someone else could edit some of it for you, possibly Tim, or you could send them. I have, I have I've been talking to somebody, so watch your space. I'd love to see it. Um, yeah, right, 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 Tim. Well, I'll make the top 20 if I do start putting some stuff out, mate, or am I going to stay um, kiboshed from that? <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't even get a get a mention then. Um, yeah. Because, yeah. Um, but like the, part of the thing with videos is if they if you don't regularly post, it's hard for people to keep you on the top front of mind, you know. So, But I'll yeah, put a word yeah. in for you the next time we do 2023 top YouTube channels. Sounds good, mate. I'll, I'll try and put a video out before then, then, eh? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Boys, I've had fun. Thanks for coming on today. I really appreciate it, making time for it. So, um, yeah, um, I'll be in touch with you guys and let you know when we're all up and live. Sounds yeah, good. Cheers, mate. All right, boys. Cheers. Guys, I've got Tim and Bryson back on the line. I'm um, tagging this on the back end of this interview. Um, Bryson reached out. They, as usual, like as typical, actually, believe it or not, of a lot of guests, um, they forgot to mention a few things. And uh, in the meanwhile, Tim's also gone out and shot himself a, a, a pair of rare fish as well. So, um, boys, fill us in on um, what you missed telling me. And, Tim, I wouldn't mind hearing about these boarfish. Go on. Go on, Mr. Boarfish. Oh, you go first, Bryson. Oh, I've, all right. Well, I guess we just got, got caught up in the interview and talking about ourselves. I really forgot to mention a big thank you to our support team during the comp. Obviously, it extends back to uh, Nikki, my partner, who I was away from for a month, and my daughter, Blair. Hopefully, one day she listens to this interview. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, so a massive thanks to them and the sacrifice they made. Um. Obviously, my father, who took me to swim training every day, and he um, 
probably the reason why I, I am such a strong swimmer. And also to Tim's, Tim's side of the family, your, your partner's family. And then we have the guys that we dive with on the regular, like like our mate Lee, who had us up in his house. He, he cooked for us. He supported us, dropped us in the water with the boat every day. We never had to do a thing. You know, we just concentrated solely on our plan. And he was a major, major influence. And you got uh, friends, Ballbag and Katie, who came up and helped out as well. So big thank you to those people. Cool. Yeah, Jack. Awesome. Exactly, bro. I think, you know, no doubt, uh, Wendy and Nikki were huge, being able to look after kids and let us go and do it. Well, you know, we ended up away from home. You were home for a month, away from home for a month, bro. So it was been a massive deal. Um, obviously, really, really grateful for that. Lee was incredible. Roy Roy helped us out so much. Lee just, Lee Jaminki, just amazing in the way of looking after us, letting us stay at his house and and cooking for us every night. We just come in, he picked us up as soon as we got there. And yeah, that was huge. Um, one of the things we talked about was that planning. You know, every night we'd sit, we'd talk with Lee, uh, Josh and Katie. Katie was was into the planning more than anything. She she loved that side of it and and what we were talking through, you know, looking at where we're gonna dive, how we're gonna do it. Um, so huge thanks to those guys. That was that was a massive big part of it. I don't think it would have been anywhere near as easy if we had to cook for ourselves, look after ourselves. You know, that was really cool. It takes up a lot of time. You don't realize it. Like if you dive in sunrise to sunset and then you come in and you're like, oh, crap, we got to cook. Oh, we got to get gear ready that we've broken that day. Oh, what to talk about? You're lucky to get five hours sleep if you have to do all that. Far out. Well done. So uh, the, the team behind it is obviously something that, uh, makes people think too, because um, sometimes it's easy to see the people that, that 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 do the do the deed. You guys obviously took it out, but I was wondering kind of about the support people behind the scenes. Yeah, it's like if you look at a world, they've got three people scouting for every one of their divers. So there's nine divers in the water. They've got a team doctor, a team masseuse, people that take charge of the boats. They ship their own boats to where they need to be around the world for that competition. There's over twenty support staff there in at the competition oh, for them yeah. to do their best and we obviously we can't match anything like that we just don't have the funds all the time but the best we can do is try and learn and emulate on a smaller scale what they do and and have that in australia mm-hmm. yeah cool. lee, lee could give us some massages next time that'd be great <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <boy. laughs> And um, you guys make ball bags. I've got to get them on the podcast too. I'm taking it that's Josh Balls. Josh Ball? Yeah. Josh. Yeah. Is it weird? Polo yeah, yeah. I've got to get them on. I want to chat about those suits too. Everyone loves them. You got – Tim, you, you're rocking a Rife. Obviously, Rife still have a lot yeah. to do with you. So yeah, uh, they make great gear as well, don't they? Yeah, they do. No doubt. And, mate, like they, they've they always supported me so well with awesome equipment. Um their guns I used long before ever being supported by them because they're just such an awesome piece of equipment. I did notice a few guys swim around in the titles with um, Euro 120s and, and reels and, you know, always grateful for, for what they do to support and and uh, loving loving their gear as, as much as ever. Yeah, sick. sick. They are one of those guns. Like I, I obviously grabbed Tim's gun off him at times when like shit was getting busy and I was like, just give me a gun. And I went down and I, I used to shoot a 120 euro. I still shoot, you know, the easy pickup stock gun off the shelf. Yeah. But, you know, that, easy gun. That consistent recipe too. I think the, the timber guns, sometimes we, we like in Aussie, like everyone loves their, their pipe guns in this part of the world. But there's something to be said for that big, so, that solid platform for shooting off. There's, you just don't deal with as much recoil. And it's, I think that, I don't know if they're accurate. I'd love to see the testing, but. In your hand, it feels like they're more consistent sometimes than a pipe gun. I don't know. Definitely. Like, obviously, I, again, I've used rifle guns for a long period of time. Um, so for me, it just becomes so natural. And the Euro is is the the pipe gun of, of timber guns. You know, it's thin enough, it's it's small enough that it still feels like you're using a, a little pipe gun and, and still got the weight behind it. Out of the water, it's a bit heavier. In the water, it's so balanced, so it's a good thing. 
Cool, fellas. And uh, Tim, you you managed to shoot a couple of boarfish. What happened there? Were you down south? No, I shot them off here off Brizzy. I went for a dive spanner. Um, Daniel Mann is is over and um, heads home on Monday. So we're trying to have a couple of dives together. So we had a dive off Brisbane just the other day. And um, yeah, I spot a dove lots and lots of times. And and I just dove off the front edge of it. There's, there's like a couple of big blocks sitting on the sand in like 35. They come up to like 30. And yeah, I just come down on the side of one of those blocks. There was three um, striped boarfish. And they're like, they've got the big black vertical bands and like a big yellow fin. And I, I, I Actually, first look, I'm like, what is that? That's a bit weird. You know, they're a bit odd. And then I remember seeing a photo a little while ago of one. So, yeah, I'm like, oh, I'm going to shoot one of those. And come down at one stage, I line it up. I thought I was going to shoot two in one shot. But then they, the biggest one sort of kicked off the back of it. I followed him and shot him. And he was, ended up going 3.1819 kilos or something. So it was a nice, really nice fish. Is that a state record? I, I think it's an Aussie record. Um <laughs> I think I think the Pucko's shot a couple over at Elizabeth. Um, Did you keep at, it? Like one point. Um, I actually, I actually at uh, Mick McDade's. Um, oh yeah. We we stopped in and saw him, and um, he was obviously frothing and wants yeah. to get a mold of it. And yeah. so he's going to cast me a mold too, and I'll get um, I'll get it painted up down with what's his name down the Goldie. So yeah, um, Glenn, yeah, Glenn down the Goldie. So um, yeah, he's got to he'd cast the mold for me as well. Uh, then, then I said to to I was driving with Andrew Jones as well. I said, "Oh, Jones, he's one down there. He dove, didn't see anything. I dove again, and um, and I saw I saw one of them, and I also saw a big tusky. So I shot the big tusky, <laughs> and um, and then um, yeah, Dan jumped in the water and, and had a dive, and and uh, I told him where it was sitting underneath the ledge behind the rock, and yeah, he shot it." And, and then we sort of moved along the reef a little bit. We're chasing snapper, and I did a, a dive, and I, there's a bit of a cave in one of the spots, probably 100 meters away. And I swam into the cave, and there was a third one that was sitting in that cave. And um, yeah, I like shot the third one. You did. Bry- Bryson said I should have left it to breed, but I don't know. Oh, about that was Spanner that said that. I wanted to kill it. <laughs> <That one. laughs> if, you, if you understand biology, one fish can't breed with itself. So I basically just. It would have been cruel to leave it. Like it's quite common, isn't it? They go in threes, and then um, the third one will change the gender to suit whatever the needs are for the for the breeding cycle, isn't it? Is that right? Or they reach a certain size, and then they change gender? I don't know. I understand. Honestly, I, I don't know that fish species enough. Um, mate, obviously some species don't do that. Like big mangrove jacks are born male or born female. They don't change. They're either that they are, you know, consistent through their life. Obviously, barramundi change. Um, they change to female. Tuskies change to male. So, like, uh, those big tuskies aren't females. They're big males. Where have you learnt a lot of stuff about specific species? Have you have you dug into some of the, like, the Grant's Guide and stuff like that? I don't do Grant's Guide. On the mangrove jacks, there was a guy actually doing, um, Toby Piddick. Mate, if you want to get a guy on to have a conversation about a species, Toby did a was doing his doctorate, doing his um, thesis on on um, mangrove jacks, and he was getting frames, and he got in contact with me. Obviously, we Bryce and I had shot some big mangrove jacks, so we gave him mangrove jacks up to fourteen point three kilos. So then his his article that he wrote up at the end of his thesis has gone across the world because he had such a wide range of of fish size. Um, but I talked a lot to him when it comes to mangrove jacks because I just obviously love the species. And man, I, I obviously learned huge amounts from him just talking, throwing theories. I'm tell, t- talking to him about some of the theories I have about mangrove jacks. Uh, but I also have done a lot of reading about other species that I care about as well. Yeah, yeah. It's good. I think fascination and endless curiosity was spearfishing tends to make you guys um, just probably put in a bit more thought. And that shows mm. sometimes, obviously, in the scorecard and comps, but even in just normal spearing. Yeah, mate, and it shows when it, when you're having conversations with people. Like people say, "Don't take, don't take those big fish in some species because they're big breeders." Well, that, that's the case for a flathead. That's the case for a barramundi, but it's not necessarily the case 
for a big tuskfish because it's a male or not necessarily the case for a big parrotfish because it's a male. It's not necessarily the case. Most of those big red emperor are actually males as well. The female don't grow as big. They don't change is what I've been told. They don't change, but the females don't grow as big as the males. Mm. So like slot sizes have become a, a big point of contention, not just here but across the world um, because of this this sort of this way of thinking, like with the larger ones are more fecund. Um, do you feel like we need to up some of the minimum sizes if we want to protect like some of these individual species rather than introducing the, you know, the larger, um, you know, like no take at the other end of the spectrum, size spectrum? On a serious note on that one, mm. I would I would – only ever look at a minimum size limit on a fish that that releases well and has a very low mortality. Jewfish should have a very small minimum size because the mortality rate is in the high 90% anyway. So catch and releases is, is of, of a Jewfish is the catch of a Jewfish anyway because they don't survive. Black Jewfish don't survive. Finger mark don't survive. Largemouth nanny guys should have no minimum size limit because they're dead anyway. Um, now, I, I know that just drop the bag limit. Like, I think you'll add uh, seven um, uh, um, nanny guy, drop the bag limit to, to three and take away the minimum size limit. That's what I think on those fish because you're killing them no matter what. Um, I think there has to be some some thinking around those those sorts of things. You, I know you're seeing that right now up in, in places like Western Australia. They don't have minimum size limits on fish with high mortality rates. So have you ever had much to do with um, consultation with regards to some of the fisheries management stuff? Mate, I tried to have something to do with some of the latest consultation and, and it's impossible. How do, you have, how do you have consultation when you can't actually answer a question because they don't ask it? Yeah. Mate, Oh, they, Queensland, well, yeah, are you talking about this, the, the scomborous, the, the, the Spanish mackerel one that just recently went out? Mate, 100%. Queensland fisheries aren't looking for consultation. They are just literally putting a consultation process in place so they can say they have been. I see in Western Australia they've done the same thing. Yeah. Um, mate, they, they literally now, it's a it's a token consultation process. Mate, yeah. the Labor governments are continually in bed with the Greens and makes it impossible for, for fisheries to genuinely have robust conversation in our community. Like we... we we are at a hiding to nothing um, at the moment we, when it comes to fisheries management. And we are more than likely going to go the way of Western Australia where we'll have nine months out of the water. It's just crazy. We, um, you know, spearfishing is such a very small part of, of, of the recreational sector and the hook and line guys make up a, a, a greater part. But then we don't, you know, like there are some parts of their practice that, you know, we can definitely criticise and then they could definitely probably do the same thing with us, saying yeah. we take some of the larger um, species and stuff like that. And I think sort of being open to, you know, the other recreational um, fishers' criticism, but then also hopefully them taking note of some of the things we're saying because like what you're saying, like the mortality rates of catch and release, um, that's a very real criticism. I haven't seen a lot of educational literature for line fishes around what those mortality rates are on some of those species, because um, uh, they they understand that most most line most good line fishermen already understand that on those species for some you know for, for some really good line fishermen don't target black dew even in shallow water because the mortality rate is so high um, they don't even to catch them at least they know and they don't they don't want to waste fish like no no fisherman says I want to catch them at least and kill fish. I, Unless they're stupid, because yeah. um, they're killing their future. Um, but it is what it is. You you can't keep a, a jewfish under seventy five centimeters of mullow weight because it's it's the minimum size limit. So they have to release them if they're under that size. Yeah. Um, so I I'm, I'm not necessarily criticizing it, and I think it's pretty common knowledge amongst the, the fishing community. And there's not much you can do about it. Obviously, if you're not targeting those fish, you can get a bycatch. But um, that's 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 something I think. Again, it's not a criticism for me. It's just reality of what the situation is. Yeah. And and I think I think in places like Northern Territory, so not West Australia, Northern Territory, they have done really good research with some of these species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be great to see a real consultation process. I think at the moment it's just the tick in the box. 
um, the way yeah. they wrote that that survey for the uh, the Spanish mackerel, like very um, very biased in terms of the the way they even wrote their questions and asked them. Um, yeah. There was no room for like for real consultation. They were closed questions. They were leading questions. Um, even if you wanted to have a say in it and and present some alternative evidence or viewpoints, there wasn't really a place to do so in the submission forms that they provided. Totally. And and on that note, one of the thank yous that we need to continually thank are the heads of the AUF. Yep. And I know you mentioned this a lot. Joining a club gives us power. Joining the AUF gives us a voice. We, we would have... 10% of the Spiros in Australia that are actually a part of the AUF. And so therefore the AUF looks like it's a small body. The spear fishermen, there are a lot of spear fishermen. And if we join the AUF, we empower um, the voice. And listen, there are some some guys in the AUF, Bryson could probably tell you the names of these these men and women that have done huge amounts, especially in, in New South Wales. You know, they're in the last few years have uh, got back um, areas that, that they were going to close in the last few years. They've enabled them to catch more lobsters. Um, these people, um, Adrian Wayne, I believe, is one of them, have done huge amounts for our sport, and we should be thanking those guys continually because of what they do. After I got off the line with you guys, I actually um, – because sometimes signing up for a club, like when you're in Brizzy, you, you guys know, like showing up for social comps is hard work. Like the weather's so terrible here a lot of the time, like – the, the the forecast comps just never happen. It's the week after, and you, it's hard to make space in your calendar when you've got kids and a wife and a job and all the other stuff, as you guys know. But you guys managed to do it. Anyway, so I did it. I signed back up to the AUF. Haven't done it for a while, and I was like, oh, the membership fees are going up a little bit. But, I mean, obviously they break down the costs and, and why that is. I think it was $125 for a year. I re-signed up with the Sunshine Coast Skin Divers. That club's going fantastic. Jeff's doing a great job up there. Yeah, it is. And um, anyway, I scooted up to Bundy for their social comp, four-hour drive, dive their comp, and then drove home in the afternoon. It was bloody good fun. And uh, just short dive comp too. It was, so, it was so good. Awesome. Now, Jeff and the guys up in the Sunshine Coast, they've got a really pumped club. Mm. They're doing really well. Yeah, that's awesome. It's good to see some of the clubs thriving. Um, but everyone can do it. And, um, yeah, awesome. Well, good, fellas. What what else did we forget? And then we better head on out and get about our days. That one's a piece of string. <laughs> that, that fish that Tim shot, exceptional fish, super rare. Um, you know, I could talk about that for 15 minutes, but according to, uh, I think it was Jeff Johnson, Tim or Stunner was telling me that they've only been – they're, they're a tropical boar fish as far north as Japan. And they've been recorded in the South Pacific, Norfolk, and Lord Howe Island. So I think one's been caught in Newcastle. There's been one off Tweed Heads and now three off Morton. And obviously the Paco shot that one at Elizabeth Reef, which would be classed as Lord Howe Island fish. So, yeah, pretty rare. Um, apparently Jackson Shields has shot them in Tonga or something like that, I think I was told. So, yeah. Super cool fish, super cool fish. Um, the the second one I got, the Australian Museum actually wants it. Uh, they want it at Hull and they're going to preserve it. Um, and the the conversation that came out of the museum was um, they actually eat these small starfish that live in deep water and um, – that's why they're very rare to see and they don't get caught on line because they don't eat normal things. They eat these little tiny starfish. They had a really black, weird chin, and I reckon that's from, like, sucking starfish out of the sand. Yeah, yeah. Paying it, look, when, I, when I started learning about species in Brizzy, like, just learning about the, the shape of their mouth it tells you a lot about where they're feeding and stuff like that. Like, mm. it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Like, those boarfish are something different too. Like, um, obviously, yeah. I, I haven't, I don't, know, I haven't even had a good look at the one that you've shot. But uh, the the giant boarfish they get down south in New Zealand, they they um, they are a weird looking fish. So, mate, they, they had the same the extended beak, yep. and on its chin, it had this like, uh, it was black like a, a big red emperor, but it had this like, the the. The meat was almost like hairs. It was so. It was. It was actually a really ugly fish. It had at the front of its forehead was as hard as a rock. Wow. Um, yeah. Proper ugly critter. Like close <laughs> up. Proper ugly. From a distance, beautiful. Yeah. 
But um, yeah. All right. Well, I'm gonna make um, make tracks. I, I want to yeah, reach right. out to this Toby Pidak fella. Um, so yeah. Tim, I have to get his details off you, and uh, that sounds yeah. like a very interesting conversation. Um, any of the other contacts you guys have, you're always more than welcome to send them in to me. I'll do my best to get them on, and especially if you give me a couple of good questions to ask. I have to talk to Toby beforehand, tell him what he can talk about, but, yeah, sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> All good. All right, fellas, we'll awesome. have, a, have a good rest of your day. Thanks, yeah, so thanks mate. See ya. Hey, guys, I'm uh, probably just pulling back in from WA today, and uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to drop this interview uh, with Bryson and Tim. I hope you got an absolute, ver- a veritable ton of information out of today's podcast. If you love the show, consider becoming a patron listener at patreon.com forward slash noobsbureau. There's 52 people sending me on adventures, and uh, I'm just returning from a Western Australia adventure. Those episodes will start to drop next week. I've got Barry Paxman and Vin Rushworth. There's a, be a bunch of cool episodes uh, to share with you. So, yeah, jump on patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro and consider chucking some fuel in the outboard. But, uh, hey, that's it for me today. Again, huge episode. Next week, Barry Paxman. Boom. Today's episode was an absolute banger, and so is our major sponsor, Adreno. Visit them at adreno.com.au. They have a huge range of equipment. You can find it at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear at checkout. When you shop online, you can save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can even use that code in-store at some of their huge mega stores Australia-wide. Price be guarantee on any Australian spearfishing equipment price. Again, visit them at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear. The Noob Spiro Podcast is incredibly proud to be partnering with Neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works, equipment you can rely on. It's the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Neptonics is also the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing gear, particularly in the US. They've got free shipping on all orders over $99 in the US. Furthermore, you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off on your entire shopping basket at Neptonics.com. Use the code NOOBSPIRO at Neptonics.com.